uh, where they, they essentially recycle every waste they, they generate. About 99% of waste generated in Sweden is recycled and only 1% goes to, to landfills. Okay, and you also have uh, different examples in different parts of the world for the case of uh, organic waste. This is for the case of composting in, in Thailand, um, biogas generation in, in India. You also have biogas generation by uh, Presco here in Benin City in Nigeria, where they are using palm oil mill effluent to generate biogas. In fact, this company, they don't, they are not connected to the national grid. All the waste they generate in the, by the, by their, from their production process is used to produce biogas, and the biogas is used to run their process and also to generate electricity for them. So now bringing it home, I will quickly talk about some of the steps we have taken at the University of Benin. Now, in order to have a different... Uh, uh, Dr. Amanegan, you have just about a minute, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm rounding up now. Professor, I'm rounding up. Professor, I'm up. Up. Professor Atemo, yes, uh, give no. Dr. Andrew, just give me a minute. Yeah, uh, Professor okay. Temo, uh, Professor Dr. Andro is the only presenter in the in in the in yeah, yeah, this yeah, okay. speech. It's so okay. we can give him yes. a little bit more time because yes. the, the what he's presenting of the, is of the interest. Thank it's okay. you. Okay, let sir. him continue. Uh, uh, Ham, let him continue. Just go ahead. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, at the University of Benin, we have decided to have a mindset a mindset shift and uh, to take an innovative way of uh, managing waste. So we entered into a partnership with institutions, different institutions like Lancaster University in the UK, Lancaster University in Ghana, the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research in Ghana, and some other partners in different parts of Africa. And we're able to uh, prepare a grant uh, and uh, we're able to get that grant, uh, the Global Challenges Research Fund. And uh, the, the focus of that grant is to drive eco-innovation in Africa uh, with focus on capacity building for a safe and secular water economy. So, and the title of this project is Recirculate. And uh, what we have done is to uh, take a different approach to waste management. And um, we are working with different, different researchers across different disciplines, um, across borders. And um, the, the, what we are looking at is to solve problems on water pollution, food production, energy generation, and essentially what we are doing in very simple terms is to take food, animal and agricultural waste streams and convert them into energy and organic fertilizer for food production. So we have been running that project for about three years now. And then we have trained um, about three PhD students. We have trained some um, different, different members of um, the, the, the institution and the members across different partners. So the focus of, our, of this particular technology is, is biogas production. So we take abattoir waste, food waste, agricultural waste, and we use it to produce biogas. Now, one of the byproducts of that biogas is digested, and it is a very rich source of organic fertilizer. And we have done a lot of training for farmers on the importance of using digestate to produce um, food. And uh, the biogas which we are producing from this process is used for energy generation, is used for heating, and uh, we, have been, we have been on this for the past three years. Now, as a result of the success of that project, we now also applied for a translational grant, which we also got, and we, we are calling this Actuate, and is accelerating the adoption of secular, economy, secular sanitation demonstration systems for improved health outcomes. And this project, this particular one, we have been running it for the past one year. And uh, the essence of this project is to actually have a demonstration plant. Uh, we have a plant currently in the University of Benin. We also have one in Ghana. And uh, for the one in the University of Benin, we have a 30 cubic meter digester. And uh, the essence of that is to produce biogas from abattoir waste, from biodegradable food waste, and uh, we are going to use that, that um, the gas we are producing to power a full building. So for the first time, possibly in Nigeria, we are going to have a green building, which will be powered by biogas uh, generated from waste material. So we are sure that we are going to get up to eight hours a day of uh, uninterrupted power from the biogas plant that we have, uh, we have designed and it's currently in, in operation. So I'm just showing you some of the um, pictures of the plant, which is still in construction. Um, these, these are the digesters, as you can see, uh, the mixing, mixing bay, the digest, another view of the digesters. So each of them is 15 cubic meters. They will generate biogas. 
uh, which we can use to generate electricity and um, ultimately use to power our center for global eco innovation. So we are currently on this project. We are almost running up the construction of this project now, and we actually started producing gas from this. And we are also, we are currently doing some um, some diagnostics of of the process. So this is the um, the approach that we have taken to sustainably manage the waste we are generating in this part of Africa. And I, I think that um, some other countries can take a cue from this. So I will end it here. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very, very much indeed, Andrew. Really a very, very innovative and uh, excellent uh, undertaking. I think the last bit of its practicality uh, will be useful to many other countries. Let us allow for a few questions to Dr. Andrew, and then before we go to the next uh, session. Anybody with a comment or a question, please go ahead and mute and uh, ask the question. Some of you can actually do the right, you can do on the chat. You have seen very nice chat questions and chat comments. You may also wish to use the chat that we have on the screen. Thank you. Andrew, any question by anybody? Can How do you have a comment? Yes, please, uh, Cherry. Yes, can I take the question? And uh, thank you very much for the presentation by Dr. Andrew. Uh, Dr. Andrew, my first question, I have about two questions, but let me just ask the first one. The first question is that uh, with classical reference to Nigeria, and you know Lagos yes. is considered as a mega city, and I know you have been to Lagos, I've been to Lagos because the huge pile of waste that are kept and the waste management agency, LOMA, in the Lagos, what they are doing, the characterization of those ways are basically, most of them are the polythene ways and the, the, uh, the, uh, the bags, the polythene bags, which is made of polyethylene terephthalate. And that yeah. one, in the recycling process, the all the complaint that they are giving is that the impurity that it carries, most of them, our bags that are thrown out are not even clean. And in purifying it, it costs a lot before you do the process to get. And in many occasions, they look at it as the, the, the recycling cost is higher than the profit that they are going to make when it, it looks at business perspective. And the incentives are not forthcoming much from the government. How do you look at this challenge in terms of the waste and the mega city of Lagos that we are growing up? And in landfill, those politics are not degradable. It's a big danger. So yeah, what can, can we, you see? Yeah, can we have another question? Dr. Cherry, that's very clear and it can go to most of the urban areas, most of the cities within the continent. Any question, on, Andrew, take note of that. You'll answer both the ones coming simultaneously, you know, together. Any other question from the participants? We have Abdurrahman Amin. Yes, Hamdi, yes. We have Abdurrahman Amin, Prof. Abdurrahman Amin, please go ahead. Can you unmute him? Uh, I think Professor Abdurrahman Amin yesterday from our discussion, he said he used his handset Android to connect uh -huh. and he's having challenge of the voice. And okay. he used laptop and he's still having that challenge. challenge. I think okay. he has not resorted that problem. Maybe if you can hear him. No, I can't hear him absolutely. Absolute. I can't hear him see too. Um, maybe he might come later on. Any other he questions? Can type. He can yeah. type. I have second question. If nobody have, is no, no, no. Coming. He's on. He's on. Abdul, Abdul, I mean, you are on. We can hear him. Abdul Rahman, you are on. I think this is Mahmoud Al Nous. I have seen him. Anus. Mahmoud Anus. Yeah, go ahead. Fadal Mahmoud Bey. Dr. Mahmoud. He's also gone mute. Okay, hello. Yes, go ahead, uh, uh, Festus. 
Please proceed, okay. Estes. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, sir. My name is Engineer Ovins from FAO. Um, it, it really pains me. We've been, there's been so much theory and theory about waste management. I don't know why it's so difficult to walk the talk. You know, uh, globally, people are converting this waste to energy. And here in Africa, we just talk, 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 and theorize it. You know, uh, generating energy from waste, like one of the options that he mentioned, has been with us for a very long time. And it's in the papers, you know, um, anaerobic combustion, generating methane from it to power, whatever. And why is it so difficult to do this, to reduce waste, increase the health, and generate some income in Africa? Why is it so difficult to do this at community level, at household level, estate? Why? What is the problem? Right, clear question. The point is, Binon, what is the main problem? Mohammed Anos, can you come on or you are still having issues? Mohammed Anos. Yes, Professor. Please go yes, ahead. Yes, Professor. Sorry, thank you. Go ahead. Yes, yes, hello. Speak, please. Yes, yes doctor. Uh, my name is uh, Mohammed Anos. Oh, I thought you had your hand up. You did have a hand up, no? Start show, though. Do you have any question or we can go to? Okay, I, I think you you are a presenter. Enter uh, Dr. Muhammad Hadek, I have a presentation by the Check it like a tool. Professor Michaka, I have a question, please. Yes, please go ahead. Go ahead, uh, uh, Hamdi. Hamdi, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think there, there is there is there is one question and uh, for two questions for the the presenter, and I have question for the colleagues from Al Abur Institute. Uh, the issue of recirculate, as you're aware, uh, I've been engaged with this recirculate project for the last three years. The problem is how to take this from piloting size where you have in the university to go further to serve the community itself. And the issue of the enabling environment, we never consider the enabling environment and the level of uh, policy makers and decision makers and also no, the community, changing the community understanding for, 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 for the segregation of, of, of waste. Uh, for the, the colleagues in, in Egypt, I believe there is a, a three years before or four years before there is a reward system for waste wow. management in, in, in Heliopolis particularly. Hmm. And uh, this, uh, I need some comments and updates because my understanding this uh, waste uh, uh, the, uh, segregation reward system well, segregation reward system was stopped for uh, reasons which is not clear. So we need to see why this is fail and how we can advance this in the future. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, thanks a lot. The, Andrew, please, can you proceed and answer those questions and we stop them? Yes, sir, I have a question. Abdul, okay, Abdul Amin, you came in. Yes, I've sought the issue. Yes, yes. sir, thank you. Yes. Yeah, the, the, it's not a question, it's a contribution because that is my area of research. Go municipal ahead. solid waste. Yes, the first observation was that uh, the uh, the uh, energy rank, which uh, the speaker mentioned, I wanted to say that the with the new technology, he did not talk about when he mentioned refuse, reuse. I expected him to have said refuse because the 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 the, the value have now changed from six, the waste uh, hierarchy have changed from six to seven, and the seventh one is completely refused the use of paper, the use of uh, both uh, I mean biodegradable material in writing, since uh, there are electronic material that one can use to write notes to send information and uh, probably uh, email systems. So definitely we should try as much as possible to do away with the use of uh, 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 paper material. 
The other option is a uh, contribution to what Dr. Kari said, that uh, most of the material used in Lagos, not only in Lagos, in Nigeria generally, are, about, are not biodegradable. Yes, he has said it in his lecture. Whether they are dirty or they are not dirty, they can be recycled. It is after the recycling, the recycled material will undergo industrial processes. And through that industrial processes, the particulates and other dirty materials will be removed, while the clean part of the non-biodegradable material can now be converted for other use. That is my contribution, sir. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Andrew, can you please go ahead and summarize the questions you have been uh, asked? Um, I, would, I would do that now. Thank you. Yeah, there was a first question on the huge amount of plastic waste generated in the city of Lagos here in Nigeria and the problems associated with recycling. Um, I, I think most of these problems, they are um, more institutional in nature in the sense of uh, policy and support from government because the technology for recycling plastics is not a matter for debate. It's already established. And you can convert plastics to different things. It's something that we can adopt. But it's a case of um, us having a rethink and having a different um, approach to this and um, trying to find a way where we can incorporate government, industry, and academia into some of our decision-making process. I, I think that's the approach we are taking with this Recirculate project, where we are trying to bring government, academia, and um, the industry together. Because if you leave the work for government alone, um, the, the chances are that it's not going to succeed. If you leave the work for the academia alone, it, there is also a problem. So we need to find a way to sustainably bring these parties together and uh, in such a way that um, we can develop some very sustainable business models around these recycling operations. So I think that's the viewpoint from which we should look at it because there's so much waste generated in Lagos. and. Uh, if we actually think that this waste is a resource that we can get value from, then we can actually start thinking about it in a different way entirely. So I, that's what I can say about, about that. Um, ju just to add, um, that doesn't remove the fact that some people are actually doing some recycling on a very low scale. So, um, but it has to be ramped up uh, and uh, we have to scale it up. Then the other question was on the issue of uh, the challenges and obstacles to this waste to energy project, particularly in this part of um, the world. Uh, you have dif in different parts of the world, people are converting this waste to energy. So why, why is it that we cannot do that here in Africa? Uh, again, the response will be similar to that of the, my response to the first question, uh, but that doesn't remove the fact that uh, uh, there are small modular plants of bioenergy projects happening in different parts of Africa. In fact, in different parts of, of Nigeria, uh, specifically, where we where the University of Benin is here in Benin City, I cited the example of Presco. Presco is a company that produces palm oil. So what they do, they generate a whole lot of palm oil mill effluent. And um, initially, when they started, they were spending a whole lot of money to treat the palm oil mill effluent before they can discharge it to the environment. So they now have to have everything and they decided to start using their palm oil mill effluent to generate biogas. And when you consider where they are now, they are using the biogas they produce to um, power their operations because they do a whole lot of heating. They are also using the biogas they produce to generate electricity, which serves them. In fact, they are even uh, giving electricity to the communities around them. So Presco is completely co disconnected from the national grid and they are producing all of their energy from the waste they generate from their production. So it's something that we can actually adopt. But one of the challenges that we have seen is technical know-how and also some sort of uh, institutional support. Like you see the bioenergy project we have in University of Benin right now. Uh, it is a project that was uh, developed in conjunction with Lancaster University in the UK, uh, the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research in Ghana with funding from the Global Challenges Research Fund, which is provided by the UK government. So you see that it's a case of having partners, uh, thinking in a different way, you know, and uh, if you put people together, I think uh, with, there's a whole lot that can, be, that can be achieved. So rather than just looking at doing something on your own, so bring partners together and have a proposal that makes it a lot of sense. So 
these are the answers I can give to this within the limit of my understanding. Uh, like I said, it's a problem I was supposed to give this presentation. So I, I hope I'm able to provide some answers. Andrew, thank you very much indeed, really. You have answered ably well. I don't thank think Gary's Gary question cuts across the African continent cities. And I think uh, the, the, the heaps he was mentioning in Lagos perhaps need another very serious thought on how to eliminate the, 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 the heaps of garbage. I think let me stop this program, this particular session, opening session, at this point in time and allow for the secretariat to take over. And then I can see my next colleague of mine, the vice chair, Professor Mosto, is the one to actually chair the next session. Can I get some guidance from Kerry, please? Thank or, you. Thank um, you very much. Thank yes, you very much indeed, Prof. I think yes. uh, you, you, you did a justice for the, 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 the keynote speakers. Uh, opening session for, for the urbanization uh, challenges, and I believe it's time to take over to check uh, if, uh, and I'd like also to thank Dr. Andro for giving us his uh, brilliant presentation. Uh, I think I need the, uh, my colleagues to identify if uh, Professor uh, Mosto uh, Anno is around or not. Uh, I need to be uh, advised. The other thing, uh, we receive a comment on the comments, which we need to respond to some of them yes. when we are waiting for to be sure that Professor Mosto is around to chair the upcoming session. Uh, the, one of the colleagues, he re wrote at 9.13 a.m., and I'm quoting, great thanks to the organizer for this wonderful conference, but as an Africans, we must learn how to value time if we are to progress. After yes. one hour and 15 minutes of people waiting, some presentation are even not yet in. Uh, I would like to inform the colleague, uh, we started the meeting before 9.13, or 9.13, as you stated very well, and this is the time where we put in the schedule. However, we need to apologize for a delay of 13 minutes, not one hour and 13 minutes, because the, the, yep. the, the, uh, the work program is stated 9 a.m. Uh, Abuja time or West Africa time. So we apologize for the 13 minutes delay in opening uh, this session, not one hour. And I promise you we will perform much better in the next time. However, the yeah. delay is not like one hour. It is only 13 minutes. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I see Professor. Thanks. Uh, yeah, it's yes, more I, I see Professor I Mosto. Just, uh, I just call Mosto. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, he is having, he is chairing one meeting in the university right Thank now. You. And he said we should uh, take Dr. over. Chiari. Thank yes, you very much, Dr. Kiari. I think uh, the colleagues from Obor Institute, they, they, they have the session two of the urban to, to, to coordinate. Uh, and I believe it's going to be by. Uh, uh, the, the colleagues from our board. Therefore, uh, you, Dr. Kiari, you coordinate the upcoming session, and then we hand over to the colleagues from our board. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Kiari. The floor is yours. You are the one coordinating this session. Thank, Thank you, very you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Hamdi, for giving me the opportunity to chair this uh, session. I'm standing on the behalf of Professor Mostro, who is supposed to chair this. Uh, we have about five presenters in this very first session one of the urban, urban and mega city planning uh, development and management technical session for presentation. The people that are involved are Dr. Abdurrahman Amin, uh, M Dr. M. A. Mahmoud, Dr. Emiri Dafe Aneka. Okay. Dr. Johnson Duque and uh, Dr. Kolo, Kolo Wale Adisa Olanaro. And all of you are present. Then I will now call on the first presenter, who is Dr. Abdurrahman Amin, to give a presentation on the health risk assessment of heavy metal persistence toxic substance PTS in groundwater surface and ground and surface water near municipal dome site within the Elorin Metropolis, Kwara State of Nigeria. You have 10 minutes to give the presentation, very brief introductions, move into your results and discussions, and you are finding and conclusion. Thank you. 
The floor is open, Dr. Amin. Uh, I'm in the process of sharing. Uh, Good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is the topic, the, the health risk assessment of heavy metal persistent organic pollutant in ground and surface water near municipal dump site within the Lorry metropolis. I will be guided by the following headline, outlines. Pollutants are harmful material that contaminates environments. They are either organic or inorganic. And they originated from different sources, either natural or geogenic. Background to the studies. We lost the presenter. Hello, sir. The background to the study. The research intend to investigate every method in surface and groundwater using different analytical techniques, such as AAS, ICP, MS. The aim and objective of the studies. The aim of this study is to carry out the risk assessment, project factor risk, and make use of the information obtained to convert waste to resources. Surface water commonly is hydro, hydro, hydrologically connected to groundwater. The connectivity is, is between precipitation, evaporation. In between precipitation and evaporation, we have abstractions by man, absorptions, and inhalation, either through injection or dharma. Then we, all, we also have translocation by plan. Through this process, the surface and the groundwater mix together and get polluted. And when the water is polluted and is inhaled or taken directly by man or animal, then there's a serious high risk. And when there's a serious high risk, there's need to carry out data evaluation. Of course, we need to look at the risk exposure, we need to look at the risk assessment, risk characterization, and risk remediation. A number of literatures are cited. Some of these literatures are shown above. That is the coordinate of the sampling point and the map of the study area. Sampling techniques. We, in these studies, we are able to make use of random and systematic samplings. And the pre-sampling activities include coordinates taking, washing and cleaning of glassware apparatus, 
uh, sample collections, a total number of 51 samples are collected during the dry season and rainy season from five sampling points, point of zero, point of 200 meter, 500 meter upstream and downstream respectively. The analytical method adopted in this study are Sorry, the analytical standard method used in these studies are American Public Health Association, uh, American Water Work Association, and Association of Analytical Chemists. Reagents and materials are of high analytical grade, imported from United States of America, but purchased from Sigma. And these are some of the equations uh, for the calculation of the earth risk. Equation one, two, three, four, five. These are some of the constant values obtained from literatures. Quality control is a measure of quality assurance. Some of the quality control put in place, preparation of reagent blanks, triplicate analysis, tabulation of relative standards deviation, tabulation of percentage, recovery as well as statistical analysis. Result and discussion. Result of physical and biological parameter during the dry and rainy season. During the dry season, the pH of water and leachate fall between 8.3 and 8.9, which involves us that the water is alkaline. Not only alkaline, this alkalinity is as a result of the compositions of bicarbonates and carbonates which eventually leads to high electrical conductivity and higher TDS, as well as high turbidity, because there is more colonial solution in water. The reverse is the case during the rainy season, because due to every damper, the concentration is diluted, the pH change from alkalinity to acidic, there is lower electrical conductivity and lower TDS, as well as uh, total dissolved solid. The result of non-metals during the dry season and rainy season, all the, almost all the parameters tested are within the NIS specification, except for phosphate, nitrate, and chloride that are relatively higher than expected uh, according to NIS and WHO guideline. Factor loading, that is the statistical analysis. From the result of the statistical analysis, three components are obtained. First, second, third. The first component at Bagede and Unilone, the factor, factors extracted are turbidity, biological oxygen demand, and ratio, biological oxygen demand, stroke, chemical oxygen demand. Why electrical conductivity, total dissolved solid, are the factors extracted at Obodele. In the second component, Bagode no. contributed pH, total dissolved solid. Why you the learning remaining to round it up? Three minutes. Why you the learning conducted, I mean, contributed pH, chemical oxygen demand, and BOD, and Obodele contributed pH, TDS, electrical conductivity, and chemical oxygen demand. From the result of this cell, the result of the, sorry, principal component analysis of the heavy metal, from the result of the uh, component uh, analysis, we have copper, chromium, and lead at Bagede, copper, chromium, zinc, and candemium at uh, Unilori, and chromium, zinc, and lead at Ogudele. In the second component, Unilori and Ogudele contributed iron and candemium, while Bagede contributed copper, chromium, lead as extracted factor. The third component, this result obtained in this third component can be pool variable, and it is very difficult to ascertain. The heavy metal in this pool Cluster analysis. From the result of the cluster analysis, uh, electrical conductivity, 
COD, TDS as a first, uh, as a cluster in the first uh, uh, component. Chemical oxygen demand, TDS, DOD, uh, another cluster. Uh, why TDS, COD, and BOD stand as the uh, third cluster? Result of heavy metals, we have iron and iron, zinc, and lead as first in the first in, in the in the first cluster. In the second cluster, lead, zinc, and cadmium. And in the third cluster, we have lead, cadmium, copper, and chromium. And finally, iron, zinc, lead, and chromium forming an association. Why zinc, lead, chromium, copper, and cadmium form another association? Ecological risk. The result of carcinogenic and non carcinogenic earth risk assessment for the selected heavy metal in both ground and surface water for adults and children, fire injection, DAMA in table 14 and 15, 16. Human beings are exposed to metals through direct injection, inhalation, mouth and nose, DAMA absorption through skin. It is obvious that the result that in both cases, the observed value are below the safe limit of unit one, which clearly indicate that there was no cumulative potential adverse health risk in water sample, fire direct injection, DAMA injection, or inhalation. Considering the value of other methods that are not available between the table, but we are able to get that of cadmium, chromium, and lead for the cancer risk calculation. The indicate, this indicate that injections of both surface and groundwater possess carcinogenic health risk since the level of cadmium, chromium, and lead are above the EPA specification. Hence, appropriate control much. measures and interventions so, should put in Your place. time is off, Dr. Abdurrahman. Conclusively, one minute, sir. Conclusively, from the result of the studies, we can conclude that the surface and groundwater from all the sampling points are basically an acidic, acidic during the dry season and rainy season. The neighborhood of the municipal dump site are at the risk of cancer. And the statistical analysis informs us that the heavy metals are both from anthropogenic and geogenic sources. Thank you for giving me the Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Draman, thank you very much for the eloquent presentations. And uh, we want presenters to stick to the time because there are others on the queue. Uh, the next presenter on the series is Dr. M. A. Mahmoud. He's going to talk on the influence of cohesive soil depth on compressibility coefficient and coefficient of volume change. The topic is very interesting. Dr. Mahmoud. Yes, sir, doctor. Take the floor. 10 minutes. OK. OK, though. OK, bro. Ashara Dakaik. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> this paper for influence of cohesive soil dips on compressibility coefficient and the coefficient of volume change. We talk about introduction and experimental work and result and conclusion. This paper for soil consolidation is the compressibility was, is, was water escape from the void of the soil when the load such as a foundation load and underground structure effect. This figure show the settlement of structure and the differential settlement for structures. This figure show the building has been consolidation settlement and the inclination. This figure, for example, for a consolidation such as the Pisa Tower and the Minaret El Balouan in Egypt. The aim of this study that uh, study the uh, changing the four consolidation parameters for cohesive soil layers under the changing of the variant dips for cohesive soil layers. Experimental role, we do four sites uh, in Egypt, uh, in Zone Calabria, and uh, we took from uh, four sites, three sample, at a variant depth, such as site one, we took uh, from 
4 and 7 and 10 uh, uh, made from uh, ground surface. This figure shows the zone that we took uh, from a sample from the site. Uh, in this uh, figure, uh, the main borehole of a site and show the depths uh, that we took the samples. This uh, is a physical properties test that we do in the sample depth, such as uh, physical properties, natural density, natural water content, liquid limit, plastic limit, bl uh, plasticity index, sharing limit, Uh, and we do there four, uh, four sites from three uh, sample from uh, one site. This figure uh, for classification of a studied soil sample using plasticity chart uh, for classification soil. We do consolidation test in odometer test And this is the uh, sample that we do in odometer test, and they figure uh, the drainage of uh, water from the soil uh, for up and left uh, two direction for uh, drainage. And this show the uh, the odometer test that we uh, do uh, the test. Uh, this figure show the Uh, the loading for pressure test and uh, loading the, the loading the two uh, sample and uh, show the consolidation test and uh, and give uh, result. Results. This is uh, the uh, paper that we do uh, relation for coefficient compressibility uh, and the variant depths. There is figures show the AV results and with uh, stresses that we are loading to it. This is the result that uh, we, uh, we, uh, we gave and relations from a depths three that's a final dips that we test with uh, the two dips above uh, from uh, dips three that we uh, we as generally we have values of a b from dips three are uh, leads to about 20 and 30 then so values from d1 and d d2 these relations show the AV values with dips. Uh, that's uh, to give uh, the value for AV uh, through the soil layers. And the uh, relation for MV volume change consolidation. Uh, so the same of uh, the AV, we do uh, the result for MV and applied stress. Uh, for uh, for the same uh, for AV uh, to uh, to uh, to obtain the relation of MV and uh, dips uh, such as AV. Conclusion. Finally, these two formulas show the relation uh, between AV and MV with a dips. Uh, these relations, uh, we can obtain the AV through the soil layers uh, due to uh, the soil layers uh, uh, for, for cohesive soil. Recommendation, uh, studying uh, soil by finite element analysis and uh, studying the consolidation parameters uh, through uh, other methods and varying, uh, varying size of test soil samples. Reference. Thank you.
for the presentation. And uh, we are going to you finish at a record time, and we are going to call the next presenter on the series, uh, who is uh, Emiri Dafe Aneka. Is going to give a presentation on the assessment of accessibility and disability planning in Nigerian construction industry. Uh, you have 10 minutes. Emiri, Dr. Emiri. Okay, good morning, everyone. Morning. So, yeah, we are going to discuss about accessibility and disability planning design in the Nigerian construction industry. Uh, so first excuse of me, Prof, excuse me. Can you enlarge the, the size of the presentation by clicking the, yes. You just move your cursor down to the presentation, yes, and click it, so you, you enlarge the size. Thank you very much. Okay. So accessibility and disability planning in Nigerian construction industry. First of all, we want to see why this problem is relevant. Today, most private and public buildings in Nigeria do not incorporate accessibility design for people living with disability. So it makes it difficult for them to gain access to schools, markets, and other public facilities, thereby limiting the places they can go to freely. And this challenge affects at least 25 million people that's about 15% of Nigerians population. So you can see that the problem is really huge. And this problem is not unique to Nigeria. The United Nations estimates that about 25% of each country's population have a form of disability. So this is a huge number. So what are the best practices in engineering projects planning and design? Well, the first one is to have a universal design. If you look at this picture, you can see that this young man, it will be difficult for him to cross this pavement because this road was not made with him in mind. So these are some of the challenges that disabled people face. So universal design means that whatever engineering construction or facility is built, is accessible to people of all categories, irrespective of gender and physical challenges. Another thing that can be done is to use signage in such a way that disabled people can have signs that can show them places that are specifically designed for them. It could be toilets and things when they go shopping or a parking spot. So all this signage that I use here will aid disabled people to get around different facilities. So we have seven core design elements for this. Though it, the list is not exhaustive, but the first one is that there has to be a level ground. So if a disabled person comes in to a facility, there need not be steps because if you're using a wheelchair, the steps will disturb him from gaining access to such a facility. And there needs to be at least a step-free entrance. The third one is internal doors and corridors should be comfortable and should not limit movements. The fourth is that ground access should be easy to assess because most buildings you assess from the ground floor. The fifth is that if there are bedrooms and toilets, they should have knobs so they can easily hold on to this and move. And also this will help elderly people who may find it difficult to climb steps. The sixth one is there should be reinforced walls so that other facilities can be installed in the building. If the um, facilities inside are not strong enough, you can't install certain disability features in them. And lastly, there should be continuous handrails along stairways. So yeah, we, we see the definition of disability planning and accessibility planning. In a nutshell, it means that 
every part of a building is accessible to people at all times, irrespective of the category of the person. So in Nigeria at Saturday, we have some national and state laws and policies for persons with disability. So the first one we'd like to consider is the national law on education. So these laws are good, but the problem here is the implementation. So this policy, for example, states that those who are disabled would have free education and this policy was last revised in 2013. So you can see that there's not an ongoing process to see how functional these laws and policies have been. So next we have a national law that is bounding in every part of Nigeria. So this law, there are certain parts that are more relevant to engineering, and that is parts one, part two, three, and four, that talk about accessibility for physical structures. Um, one that covers road transportation. Part four covers seaports, railways, airport facilities. So one important statement in this law is that no building would get an approval if it does not contain disability planning and accessibility design. So it's a good law and it protects the interests of disabled persons. And some states in Nigeria like Lagos, which is the commercial capital of Nigeria have gone further to create their own local laws that protect the rights of disabled persons. And also, it kicks against all forms of discrimination of persons living with disability. And we can see from the second point that a disabled person living, a person living with disability shall have the rights and necessary facility to access public buildings and public spaces. And no building should be constructed without the necessary accessibility aids such as lifts, but as we are aware, sometimes there's interruption of lights, so these facilities may not work as intended to. So there should also be provision of ramps and other facilities to make access easy for them. So for this research, we carried out a survey on construction industries in Nigeria, and we found out that only about 5% of construction industry have knowledge about accessibility and disability planning. And more than 65% were without any knowledge of accessibility and disability planning in construction industry. So from the results, we can see that in the construction industry, 80% of them do not include this design. So majority of buildings in Nigeria make no provision for people living with disability. And we see that these challenges exist because there is lack of specific education on planning and disability planning. So if you study engineering in Nigeria, there is no specific course that teaches engineers how to design for persons living with disability. So when they graduate and begin to do design, they do not have knowledge on how to construct buildings without for persons living with disability. And also many construction companies have never employed someone who is disabled. So if they do not participate and their voice is never heard, then it is difficult for them to be included when planning for construction. So with this, it opens the room for implementation of policies. So these policies exist, but they are not implemented. So today in Nigeria, there is little data on persons living with disability, and there is no evidence of persecution of persons who have violated these laws on disability. So there is need for more research to focus on this 25% of the population. So 
By doing this, they will create greater awareness of already existing laws and increase the accessibility and disability planning. So there is need for future investments and policies on road development, transport services, health services must always consider the needs of persons living with disability. So what do we recommend? It is recommended that government has to enforce laws in the areas of infrastructural design, such that before any building is approved, there must be provisions to cater you for You have the two minutes. Needs. Okay. There must be provisions to cater for the accessibility needs of persons living with disability. And also in Nigeria, we have a national building code, but it does not provide standards on how to care for the needs of persons living with disability. So these standards must be included in the national building code and they must be enforced. So it must not just exist, but it has to be enforced. Also construction firms, government should carry out disability and assessment before construction of public buildings so that they can determine the accessibility needs of persons with disability way ahead of the construction. Fourthly, local government has to plan and design public facilities in such a way to provide for their needs. So existing laws should be reviewed from time to time to reflect global realities. Engineering firms and government should carry out disability and assessment before commencement of construction projects. And lastly, disability planning and design should form part of the Nigerian University curriculum for engineering discipline. So by doing this, we'll be able to address these challenges that exist in urban and mega cities in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Emery. And uh, the next presenter on the row is Dr. Johnson. Hello, Dr. Johnson Dukwe. In that yes, I'm with you. Yes, yes I'm with can you. Take Good the morning. floor. Ten minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. On share your screen, Mr. Emery. You can start the screen share while the other participants are sharing. I cannot start the screen share. Oh, yeah. okay. You can share your screen, Johnson. All right. Hello? Yes. We are waiting. My name is Johnson Nadikwe. Yes, my topic is uh, evaluation of domestic transportation and the utilization of natural gas in Nigeria. The presentation outline introduction, the statement of the problem in an objective significance of the study, research methodology and result and discussion and conclusion. The natural gas is a fossil fuel energy source that form deep beneath the Earth's surface. Its natural gas contain many different compounds. The largest component of the natural gas is methane, which I normally call the landlord. I normally call him the landlord of the natural gas. Compound with one carbon atom and four hydrogen atom. Natural gas also contains smaller amount of natural nuclear, which Sorry. are also hydro. Is it from our side? The screen is not, it's just showing you a desktop. Okay. No, I am seeing it. It's just showing the desktop. Yes, from this end. Others, can you see the screen very well? 
No, the test. Okay. Oh, we can't see the presentation. Oh, we can we see are the just presentation. seeing your desktop. Uh, yes, you can just no, see the you desktop. Can't. You are you are discussing the screen. He's showing. Are you not seeing it? No, we are we are not seeing. What you need to do, you need to open the file on your desktop. Then you can click on the share screen of the Zoom, and then now highlight it. Then it will come up. You can unshare it, open the screen, open the presentation, right. and then you can now go to the Zoom. Aha. Uh -huh. Now open open your Now open it and just share. Are you seeing it? We are not seeing. Is he OK? It's coming up. Yep. All right, natural gas is a fossil fuel energy source that from deep beneath the Earth's surface. Its natural gas contains many different compounds. The largest component of natural gas is methane, which every one of us know, a compound with one carbon atom and four hydrogen atoms. Natural gas also contains other smaller amounts of natural liquid, which are also hydrocarbon liquid and no hydrocarbon gases such as carbon dioxide and water vapor. Those are the impurities in natural gas. The natural gas business internationally has experienced a robust response over the years now. And Nigeria as a country have received our own share in the business transaction. Nigeria rank as the largest holder of the natural gas proving. Of the natural gas proving. Of the natural gas proving statement. The main obstacle that, that was faced by this research in the meeting, the aim and objectives are the current energy crisis affecting this research in the area of collecting data for the evaluation, lack of appropriate policy to regulate the gas sector so as to avoid shared practice was another challenge of this study. One of the major drawback of using natural gas as a transportation fuel is that it is not very dense to the public. The aim of this research is to study evaluation of domestic transportation and the utilization of natural gas in Nigeria. Specifically, the study achieved the following objectives to determine the rate of gas utilization in Nigeria domestically and industrially, to determine the effectiveness of Nigeria gas transportation system for the point of production to the reservoir point to determine the effectiveness of that sector to growth of Nigeria economies by increase in the GDP. The significance of this study as well. There are no doubt that this study will be great benefits to the society. The study will improve foreign direct investment into our nation as well, thereby promoting employment that will increase the nation GDP. This study will create awareness in the area of diversifying the Nigeria economic that this mono crude oil based. This study will advance technology efficiency in gas production and marketing. Internationally, reputation will be accorded to Nigeria through the awareness of this study on the area of announcing the abundance gas reserve. The method and materials that I gathered during this research time, the material used in the making, the aim and objective of this study are one, gas sample obtained from an associated well in Soku field, of which can be described as a wet gas due to the presence of condensable gas contained in the natural gas stream. Gas chromatography, 24 pipe, the oxide diameter is 610 millimeter, having the thickness of 6.35 millimeter according 
to the ASM B36.10M IBN to 2004 for specification. Below is the table different pipe size, process and instrumentation diagram. I spent I6 version 7.1 and the AutoCAD was also used. Finite elements analysis and the, and the computational field dynamics, process and instrumentation diagram. The gas composition were also obtained through the application of gas chromatography technology at River State University of Science and Technology in River State, Portacourt. In achieving the essence of this paper, several computer software applications, such as the ISPET access version 7.1, was also used in ascertaining the gas diversification capacity. FE, FEA was applied in determining the pressure distribution to the pipeline through computational fluid dynamics. Carbon steam pipe of 24 was designed with the aid of, with the aid of CAD software application due to its accessibility, costs, and costing option. Simulation process, sim, simulation process separation of heavy hydrocarbon present in the natural gas, gas stream like C3 and C4 was achieved through IC separation process and P ID Colo. This were the table shadow for different pipe sizing. We can see the um, uh, ASME B35, the specification that is needed the size inches 24, 28, 36, and 48, based on their specification and the diameter as well. The relationship used in this design of the pipeline as follows. We are a cross section of the pipeline, DI inside the diameter of the pipeline and V is the velocity of the pipe. The gas is expected to have a set thin flow rate, which is most time based on the supply of gas per day. The relationship between the flow rate and the cross section of the pipe to determine the velocity of the gas stream. Yeah, this is the column you of the PID. Two yeah, minutes. This is, okay, this Summarize. is the column of PID, the propenizer and the depropenizer. Yeah, the pipe design with ASP Big 30, Big 36.10M specification. These are the pipe, and the pipe must surely satisfy the needed specification method. Results and discussion. The natural gas quality measure, the natural gas characterization was achieved through the use of ISPEN ICS package. The soft wear now simulates and calculates this stream after all components have been imputed based on the molecular weight. The blend cut of the stream into the IPO component gives the critical pressure and temperature at which the fluid required to function. The boiling point of the natural gas fraction in respect to the mode, we can see the critical pressure part of the, this thing and the mode percentage. The figure below is the maximum temperature required for a gas in the pipeline, which is about 175 centigrade. This temperature is relatively high and so needs some separation to avoid hydrate formation during transportation and utilization process. This is the boiling point of natural gas fraction in respect to the mode of chromatography of natural gas. The boiling point of natural gas fraction Thank with you. respect to the mole as well. Yeah. The result of the simulation is displayed on the Excel sheet, presenting it in a tabular form, giving the clarity of the result achieved for the effective analysis. Separation of the area component was done by the use of the deep analyzer simulation process, of which it is tabulated as it is an exact sheet spreadsheet due to the flow rate of the two stream having the over S stream Every closed field is to be avoided. Every closed field is to be avoided. This we also achieve through the same column separation as before, but for the set of the temperature. Conclusion, the domestic transportation project via pipeline and other properties approach such as the LNG and CNG can be seen as a valuable solution to many challenges faced by the LNG in transporting natural gas. It would be of a great benefit to Nigeria economic company can invest in a domestic transportation and utilization of natural gas. Domestic utilization and transportation of natural gas Thank will you. also promote employment to the female unemployed youth. 
It is known that transporting natural gas from the point of production to market involved various approaches. Thank you. As discussed you are, above. So your time is please. off. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The next, uh, thank you, Dr. Johnson Ndukwe. Uh, the next presenter is Kolawale Adisa Olanade. He's going to make a presentation on the effect of sulfate attack on the strength of cement brands blended with cassava peel ash. Uh, you can check the floor. You have 10 minutes. Kolawale? Hello, Dr. Kolawale. He sends a chat message that he is the one to present after this one and introduce himself as a caller wallet, but we cannot get him. I think there is a challenge I, of connection. I, no, I am here already. Okay, okay. You can take the floor. Thank you. You have 10 minutes. I don't know whether I've been... Uh, okay, I can share my screen now. You can share your screen. Yes, can you see my screen? Can you see my screen? Very clearly, yes, I can see it myself. Very clear. Thank yep. you so much. So my presentation is on the uh, performance of cassava peel ash. If it is blended with cement, how does it, uh, uh, what effect does a sulfate uh, environment have on such uh, material? Uh, this, this particular project is part of a larger project that, uh, you call the local local care project. It's a very big project which we started around 2018, and it was under this under German African Innovation Incentive Award. And the the project was sponsored by German Ministry of Education and Research. Uh, in 2018, only out of about uh, 36 African countries that applied for this innovation work, it was only four of us from Africa, a participant from Egypt, Kenya, Uganda, and my own self were part of those that were selected. Uh, in this particular project, which is called the called Local Care Project, which is an acronym for Low Carbon Livelihoods Cassava Residue for Performance, is to utilize these cassava peels, which has consumed, which has considered, which is considered to be a nuisance after processing cassava. So you permit me to give background about this. It is all about the sustainable construction because we believe that concrete is a major material that is consumed in high quantity next to water. Apart from water, which is a natural resources, there is no other material that is as consumed as concrete because concrete is a, is a major material which we use for to provide infrastructure. Africa that is having a gross deficit in infrastructure will definitely need to consume a lot of this material to really bridge this gap. But um, unfortunately, concrete is a major contributor of uh, CO2 because the production of cement itself constitutes almost about eight to 10% of the global CO2 emission. And in order to really mitigate the effect of climate change, there is definitely need to really reduce the amount of cement that is used in concrete. And then that's why we are making a lot of effort. Unfortunately, there is no commercially available material that can replace, that can replace up, uh, uh, Portland cement as of today that effort is being made to really reduce the consumption by finding substitute material that can be replaced partially. So the greener the concrete is, the better for our society. If you look at this particular figure, you will see that most of the developing countries, most of the developed countries, they are already reducing the amount of cement they consume, unlike developing countries of Africa. You can see you are consuming a lot of cement, which is also contributing uh, a large quantity of CO2 into the atmosphere. Our effort is to utilize cassava peel. We know cassava African is an agrarian country that produces huge quantities of cassava, and cassava is a food, is a, is a source of food for close to 500 million people in the world. And then it's about 80% of a source of food for people in sub Saharan Africa. And cassava is already even going into dry countries. We are we moving into the north because most of the is a very rugged material. It's a, it's a, it's a product that can grow almost everywhere. 
uh, if if planted. Presently, these are the current value chain in the in, in, in the cassava production. You can use cassava to produce cassava ash, starch, cassava sheaves, pellet oil. In all of this, there is a one, there is only one byproduct that is produced, that is pips and pop. Most often than not, pills are being consumed by animal, by animal, it's used as for animal feed. But there is a limitation to which this can be because uh, of the content of hydrocyanic acid, which cassava usually contains, which could be poisonous to animal. And then because of the low content of protein. So for that reason, we have this huge of tea cassava pills that has been deposited. This is where our local care project is really coming up. How do we utilize this waste? For something that is more beneficial. So this is the new value chain you have just created for the use of cassava. The plant fruit, you, you during processing, you generate waste and then you get your food. But this waste, we can extract some starch from it, which can be used as a chemical construction. Then the ash, the remaining pills can be burnt, can be used as fuel to burn uh, clay, so that we have a burnt clay for local building housing construction. The ash that is gotten from it, we can use to replace uh, about 20% of our uh, cement. Then this is just uh, the, 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 the low emission processing of the bio waste, which we have already developed in this project. A lot of work has been done on use of cassava peel ash. We have already determined the activation conditions. We have the characterized cassava peel ash. We have done virtually almost all the possible Tests to be conducted or research to be conducted on viability of cassava peel as cassava peel as, as a partial replacement for cement in construction. But what we are still what we are still working on is performance of this concrete, that is the cassava concrete, in a very high in, a, in an ash environment, like acidic environment and sulfate environment. So I'm only presenting a part of it, which is performance of this in the sulfate environment. So we all know that there are different sources of uh, uh, sulfate attack, which could cause a lot of deter deterioration to our country, as you, as you can see here, most especially in the coastal environment. In the coastal environment, the structures are being deteriorated because of the sulfate attack. And the mechanism is any sulfate ions, whether calcium sulfate, whether sodium sulfate, whether potassium sulfate, if it reacts with C3A aluminum in, in, in cement, it will form what you call entrigite. This entrigite is a very weak material which gives room for, uh, uh, for penetration of uh, a baby, baby chloride solution or surface solution. So surface attack is of cement-based product is very, very- You have two minutes. And yes, yes. So in order to round up, this is what the summary of what we have done in this, uh, in, in this study. Then we have this particular result. We have done the chemical analysis to compare. We use, we look at about four types of cement in Nigeria, and then we see how, to what extent the cassava pillage can be replaced with them. And then we expose them to sulfate attack, and then we determine the strength. And we find out that there is a limitation uh, that presence of cassava pillage usually reduce uh, the sulfate attack. A lot of effort is being made to really promote the use of cassava peel in, the, in the, everywhere. Then in conclusion, uh, cassava material or any biomaterial which can be used for supplementary, uh, supplementary cementitious material has the, has the potential to delimit effect of sulfate attack. And then Africa has a lot in this that can be done. But what is required is we need regional and international collaboration for, to have shift a meaningful, to make a meaningful achievement in this area. Thank you. So I want to appreciate and acknowledge the Minister of thank Education, you. and thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kolawale. I think uh, we have come to the end of these sessions where we are going to move into discussions. The participants, the floor is open for questions to these five gentlemen who have made the presentations on the various and different topics on their technical presentation. However, myself being the moderator and being having the privilege of having the mic, I will ask the first questions. Uh, my first question goes to the last presenter, Kola Wale. Uh, since you are using the cassava ash to reduce the sulfate attack in the cement, what are the constituent 
constituent elements or metals in the cassava peel ash? This is my question. Now others will ask, direct it specifically to the person, and then they will jot and respond to you. Questions, the floor is open. Dr. Kerry, I see the Obur stage, uh, Obur presenter, they're raising their hand. I have seen the Obur presenters having questions. Uh, Obur side, please, you can check. They are physically in a group. You can see them in a large group sitting down because of the hybrid. You can check the flow. OK. Good morning, everybody. My question for the research number 28 for Adrakman Amin. Uh, it is not a question more than a comment. Uh, waste management strategies in the nowadays has used so many technologies to get rid of metallic, heavy metals. It is well known that plastics is the most, is the most dangerous metal on the human being. It has been uh, recorded that plastic particles enter the human body through foods. They said that it is nearly five milligrams every week, which causes cancers, here, uh, heart problems, and inspiration problems. One new method of new technology to recover uh, seas and water channels from particles of plastic is called uh, magnetized liquid. My question is for Dr. Abdurrahman, if we have some note or additional information about magnetized liquid. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Dr. Mozell. Hello? Hello, go ahead with the question. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is to uh, Dr. Emery. Uh, his presentation on the assessment of uh, planning and construction. Uh, it appears to me that uh, a lot of concentration uh, is on those who are disabled from the, you know, their feet. That those who are crippled, they cannot walk. Uh, in this uh, day of uh, artificial intelligence and smart cities, I want to know what is also being provided for the blind, because uh, whether they can now, buildings will be accommodating them in future, because the idea is uh, for the disabled person to take care of himself with little or no assistance uh, from anybody. So I want to know about others. Of course, there are those who also have uh, hearing disability. The most prominent, uh, those who get around by themselves are those who cannot walk and those who cannot see. So my question is, what provision uh, is being made or will be made for those who cannot see to take care of themselves on the road uh, or entering uh, modern buildings. Thank you. Uh, we have also a third question from Dr. Magdiza. Can we ask now? Yes, go ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask uh, Mr. Oland uh, for the uh, paper effect of uh, surface attack on the strength of of uh, friend uh, with Kasata Hill Ash. Uh, can you, uh, uh, would you please, uh, to can, uh, what uh, are the uh, chemical constituents of the Kasata uh, Hill Ash? Uh, and uh, what's the effect of uh, each? I think the Obur side 
their mic side went off and they didn't discover and because he finished and went and sat down. Let me talk to them on the group. Uh, Dr. Kerry, by the time we are waiting, can we give the presenters to Yes, to the presenters, please can you uh, start responding? You can take the floor. Okay, yes, uh, and if, if I'm allowed to talk first, I can quickly respond to the question. I think the two questions, hello? Hello? We can hear you, go ahead. Yes, I, I think the two questions that were asked, they are almost the same. The first uh, questioner was uh, Dr. Kiar was asking the chemical composition of the CPA and the same uh, question was also asked from this Obur uh, Institute. Yes, cassava pillage when it is castine, when it is castined under uh, well uh, the determined conditions that is 700 degrees centigrade for about uh, 90 minutes you get ash. This ash contains substantial quantity of silica oxide. The silica oxide is almost about 60% uh, and it contains some quantity of alumina and then ferros, uh, ferric ion too. It can be for any material to be concerned to be considered as pozzolanic. The combination of all these three oxides must be more than 70%. And what does it do in the, in the, in the, in the cement? When water is added to cement, the hydration reaction takes place and there is calcium hydroxide, which is formed as a byproduct of the, of the chemistry of cement. We have the calcium silicate hydrate, hydrate which is the, the stone, which is the one that is really doing the binding work. The calcium hydroxide is a byproduct. Silica oxide in cassava peel ash and similar pozzolanic material like that, we react with this calcium hydroxide to form additional silicate silicious material, which is also filling the pores within the concrete to really avoid, to really make the concrete to be more dense, so that to be denser, so that there will be a limit to which uh, unwanted materials in, we, we permeate it so as not to cause any disruption within the concrete. So this is what is the chemistry of this performance of this type of, that type of material. Thank you. Abdurrahman Amin. Yes, sir. There is a question directed to you. Go on. What, okay, what is the question? Ah. You didn't check the question? Yes, I was. I went to toilet. <laughs> I just came back now. Okay. Please let okay. me repeat the question. Okay, he's he asks about uh, the techniques, the method used in removing the uh, the waste, like the plastics and the others, as you have mentioned. If we have some, if we can have some informations on the mechanic, ma magnetic recovery methods that are used in getting some of the waste, it will. Okay. There are different techniques. We have the physical method, which is more common in this part of uh, the world. That is uh, hand picking into biodegradable and non biodegradable. So, uh, after separating into biodegradable, biodegradable and non biodegradable, the biodegradable components cannot be converted to different resources through either aerobic or anaerobic process. Why the non-biodegradable? There are a lot of companies even here in the learning that are processing these biodegradable materials. For instance, the polyvinyl chloride plastics for table water, there are machines that can cut it into uh, pellets. There are other machines that can transform it into powder. There are a lot of markets for it. And the market is that people will come and buy, some industry will still come and buy that and dissolve in some chemicals, which I may not be able to open up here, and then uh, use it to manufacture new set of uh, material uh, for 
production. The other aspects that are number degradable are the metal content, which are also having high market values. There are a lot of there are a number of companies in Lagos and Kano that are seriously looking for waste metal material. And of course, the electronics materials is also known by degradable. But in developed countries, there are there is advanced method, and the advanced method is in line with what Professor Andre presented the other time. Quite unfortunate. In Nigeria, there is no single engineering landfill. So there is need for us to have an engineering landfill, which is quite different from what uh, Dr. Andrew said the other time. The engineering landfill is so sophisticated in the sense that it has the ability to separate all the waste coming into not only biodegradable, non biodegradable alone but into different fractions and then transfer into different compartments. And from there, buyers can come and then purchase for further use. That is uh, how far I can go as far as that question Thank is you. concerned. Sir. Thank you. I think the next is the this uh, MFRI. I remember uh, Dr. Dantata asked uh, questions about Hello, sir. A question to you. MFA. Hello, sir. Yes. I can't hear you. Hello. Can any can everybody hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Others, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Can hear okay. you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Abdurrahman. I mean, the next yes, question was sent to Dr. Emery. Dr. Emery, on your presentation on the disabilities, accessibility, and uh, there was a question from Dr. Dantata, which was asking that your concentration was more on those who have, uh, who are disabled by feet. And he's asking, what are the chances for the blind in terms of the development of our infrastructure now that AI and smart cities, uh, under the AI and smart cities, what is happening? That is his question. Dr. Imiri, I think he is off. Hello, I think he is off. Uh, in the absence of the, any other questions, even though we have five minutes to go, I think uh, if there are no other questions, I think I will bring the session to a close. And then we will go for a little break. We will go for a little break and we will be back by 11.30. Now in the next 25 minutes, we are coming back for the second session of the Oban. The second session of the Oban is going to be chaired by Dr. Hiba El-Dashan. And the Dr. Hiba El-Dashan, when we come back, you are the one to take over as a chair of the next Oban session too. We are now proceeding for a break. Anywhere you are in the next 25 minutes, we are back here on the net. Thank you very much for all the presenters. Thank you for all the participants. Thank you very much. So thank you so much for the opportunity. We look forward to the next session. So we come back what time? Exactly what time? Because we are different time zones. It's 30 minutes now. 30 minutes. It's in 25 minutes, we are coming back and it's okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the time. Thank you, moderators. Thank you, everyone.
Hello. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. Excellent. Great, great, great. Welcome back from our tea break. I'm sure you must have taken a coffee, tea, or any other things and, uh, online. Uh, without wasting much time, we are back from our break, and we are going to the second session of the urban, which is uh, urban two, and uh, the person, the moderator, I will call on the moderator to take over, Dr. Hiba Eldashan from the Obur Institute. She is the one to moderate this session. Dr. Hiba? Yes. Yes, Shukran. thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you for handing me the floor. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ladies and gentlemen and dear participants, good afternoon. Uh, welcome back to our first day of our conference, the first ASRIC conference on engineering and informatics for, uh, for Africa's organization. Uh, let me first uh, start this session by introducing myself um, to my online colleagues. Uh, I'm Hebat Dehshen. I'm a lecturer of management in uh, Obur Institute, and I'm uh, the head of the quality assurance unit in the Institute. Uh, thank you, Professor Kiara, for uh, handing me the floor. And, um, and thank you for giving me uh, the pleasure to moderate uh, this uh, second session, which is supposed to start uh, now, 12.30 till 1.30 p.m. Cairo local time. Uh, during this session, uh, we have uh, four research uh, papers uh, to present. Each is supposed to be given um, a time span of 10 minutes. Uh, we're going to uh, start with the first uh, paper. It's a parametric study uh, about the contribution of steel shear reinforcements in two-way shear resistance of flat plates presented by Dr. Uh, Mohammed Mahmoud uh, Badawi. Uh, would you have the floor for 10 minutes? I would like to present my paper, Contribution of Steel Shear Reinforcement in Two-Way Shear Resistance of Flat Blades, Parametric Study. The contents of this presentation, problem, objectives, literature review, experimental work, evaluation of experimental results, analytical study, conclusions, and recommendations. Problem, punching shear is one of the most important criteria that control the design of flat slabs. These figures show typical punching shear failure for garage building and the mechanism of two-way shear failure. Here, there are many traditional ways to resist the punching shear stresses such as that A, deep slab and the large column, slab with column head, slab with drop panel and column head. This figure show alternative new methods for bunching shear resistance, such as that shear stub rails, shear stirrups, legs in which confirmed in the new edition for the Egyptian code of practice ECB 203 for 2018. And finally, shear head is the current research. Objectives, study the behavior of flat slabs with shear heads under punching shear experimentally and analytically. The parameters used in the study were Changing the column aspect ratio, increasing the length of steel shear head arm, different arrangement of steel shear heads, 
effect of the changing the concrete compressive stress. Then propose design equation formula to predict the ultimate bunching shear capacity of flat slabs with shear heads. Many codes such as that SEI, CSA, ECB suggest a distance equal to D divided by two from column phase to calculate bunching parameter of bunching shear capacity. But European code suggest distance equal to two dips from column phase. And the British code suggest the distance 0.75D from column phase. The SEI code is the only code that deal with shear heads. Experimental work. Many parameters taken in the experimental work, such as that column aspect ratio, one by one, two by one, and four by one. The second, increasing length of shear heads, L, 1.75 from height of shear head leg and 2.25 height of shear head leg. And finally, cut end angle for shear heads. These figures show fully penetrated steel shear heads placed in between top and the bottom steel reinforcement at the connection between flat slab and the column to resist the bunching shear stresses as a modern way to resist the bunching shear stresses, then casting the concrete in the lab. This figure shows the test setup for flat slab specimen in the lab. These figures show loca locations of electrical strain gauges and LVDT locations on the bottom face of the slab to measure the deflection and the strains in the slab and reinforcement steel bars. Here, the location of electrical strain gauges in shear head legs illustrated in the shown figures. The crack pattern and the mode of failures at top and the bottom face shown in this figure. And also, the crack pattern and mode of failure, but for column aspect ratio four by one at top face and the bottom face. Here, the load deflection curves and the contribution values of shear heads are represented. Numerical analysis. These figures show numerical modeling analysis by using ANSYS program 2019. And they show the top and the bottom reinforcement and fully penetrated steel shear heads with different lenses for all specimens. These figures show accepted convergence between experimental and the numerical crack pattern. And also in these figures, but for column with aspect ratio four by one. Also, these figures show close crack pattern between numerical and experimental results. These graphs show close result between experimental and the numerical results as a verification for the study. Also, this figure and the graph show shear contribution of shear heads in this parametric study. This chart show parameters were taken in the first parametric study, such as that the changing the column aspect ratio from one to one, two, four to one, and the changing is the arrangement of shear head 
and changing the compressive strengths of concrete. This chart also presents the second barometric study in which concentration on the changing of compressive strengths of concrete. This figure presents a new arrangement of shear heads used in this study. Proposed equation. The target for our study was get the proposed equation. These steps can be followed to obtain the parameters in the proposed equation. The proposed design formula for punching load capacity could be expressed as follows. Where V capital is the ultimate punching shear load, FCU is the compressive strength of concrete by megapascal units, B node one bottom bunching perimeter, A1 distance from compression fiber of concrete up to compression fiber of shear heads, B node two top bunching perimeter, E2 distance from compression fiber of shear head up to CG of tension reinforcement. This table show close result and accepted proposed equation in which is a percentage between proposed equation and experimental gave a good result for applicable conclusions. Flat slabs with steel shear heads enhanced the behavior and the mode of failure of the slabs to be a semi-brittle failure instead of pure bunching failure. Number two, efficiency of the finite element model in simulation of reinforced concrete flat slabs with shear heads was proved from comparison finite element model with experimental results. Finite element models give crack better almost similar to the experimental ones and the same trend of the load deflection response. Embedded steel shear head sections have a good efficient in enhancing the ultimate bunching shear capacity and the ductility of flat slats. The, exper the experimental results were compared with the result of the different cool ECI 318, ECB 203, and the European Code 2, and found, and found that the result of the codes are conservative. conservative. The European Code is the closest code for finding the percentage of concrete contribution. The proposed new formula gave a good prediction for calculating the bunching shear capacity. And finally, recommendations for future work a change the depth of flat slabs, other arrangement, a study other shape of steel shear head, a change in flange width of shear heads, presence of opening in flat slabs. Finally, I would like to thank Professor Dr. Abdullah Dashan for his continuous support for all staff members in Umur Institutes. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Badawi, for your valuable presentation, and thank you for respecting the time span. Uh, next uh, in the row, we have uh, the presentation of the research paper submitted uh, by uh, Professor uh, John Ansu Gaiba. He's going to uh, uh, present a case study about modeling electricity demand response potential for residential households in Ghana. Uh, Professor Gaiba, uh, would, would you please accept taking the floor for the coming 10 minutes? Are you here with us? Professor John Gaiba? Um, Professor Gaiba, do you hear me? Right. Then I think we need to move to the uh, third presentation in our session, 
Uh, it's a paper for uh, uh, Professor uh, Gujovi Gabava. He's going to present us a paper about the dynamics of spatial spread and rainwater management in the city of Lome, Togo. Uh, Professor Gabka, Gabfa, um, please accept the floor for the coming 10 minutes. Are you with us? Thank you, connection problem. Professor Gaffa, are you with us? Okay. The connection is very well from my end. Dr. Heba? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, uh, the connection is very, very good from my end. I can hear you loud and clear. So uh, I, I think you can call for the next. So I can call for the last paper. Yes, I'm going to call for the last paper in our session. It's from Professor Michel Chutsotwa. Uh, he's going to present uh, um, a case study for a geospatial ICT infrastructure for city management in Africa. Uh, Professor Michel, are you with us? Hello, Professor Michel, are you with us? Um, uh, Professor Hiba, I think I, I, I may request you to go to the next session to call yes. Amir Ibrahim yes, and M A. Right. Mohammed. Then we are be able to identify the other speakers. Maybe they ah, have. Yes. Right. Okay. Okay, um, due to the uh, uh, un, uh, uh, inability to reach uh, Professor Gaiba, Professor Gabafa, and Professor Chutsua, uh, then we will have to move to the uh, following session. Uh, we're going to have uh, Dr. Amr Ibrahim from Abu Institute, who's going to uh, present a paper concerning the sustainability of nuclear energy and minimum environmental impacts of nuclear waste using fact reactors. Professor Amr, uh, please accept the floor for the coming 10 minutes. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Dr. Amr Ibrahim. Uh, working in High Institute for Engineering and Technology at El Ubur. I'm going to present a paper uh, entitled Sustainability of Nuclear Energy and Minimization of Environmental Impacts of Nuclear Waste Using Fast Reactors. Contents, introduction, aim of the work, the methodology, results, and the discussions, conclusions. Nuclear energy. Energy, as we know, is essential for organization of all countries, including Africa countries. Today, 16% of the electricity produced worldwide comes from 4 and 50 operating nuclear power planets in 30 countries. And according to the International Atomic Energy Agency, demand for nuclear power will increase by 25% in the low projection and by 100 in the uh, high projection. In the face of limited resources of uranium, which is the fuel used in nuclear reactors, and increasing demand for nuclear power, there is a need for a new nuclear system that will achieve sustainability and minimize waste produced by nuclear reactors. Nuclear energy. Splitting atom, which is uranium, is release neutrons and generate heat energy. We can use this release energy for production of electricity. And in this uh, fuel, uranium, we also have three neutrons produced, fast neutrons, to keep the chain reaction going. What is nuclear reactor? Nuclear reactor is a device to initiate and to control the fission chain reaction. The uranium atoms, as we I said, uh, is fission and release heat energy. This heat energy is used to uh, boil water and produce steam, which will operate turbines and 
gave generators the motion needed for uh, producing electricity. If we know that energy released per fission is a million times more than a chemical reaction, we can see the efficiency of producing energy from a nuclear fuel. Uranium is mined and refined as natural resources. However, the uranium that we obtain in its natural form composed mainly of uranium 238, which composed 99.3 percentage of the uranium. Only 0.7 percentage of the uranium is uranium 235. We say that because only uranium 235 is uh, fissionable or easy to fission in nuclear reactors. The large amount of uranium 238 can be used to produce uh, fission and the thermal energy in current reactors, which is called thermal reactors or slow neutrons reactors. And we need also to increase the percentage in the uh, natural uranium of uranium 235 to a, a certain value, approximately three to five percentage, in order to keep the neutron interaction or strain reaction keep going and reduce, continue to produce energy. <coughs> this means that we must separate uranium 235 which is a very, very small amount from uranium-238, which is a very large amount. And this amount of uranium-238 can be used in thermal reactors, which we are trying to use. So, as I said in the beginning, for the sustainability of nuclear reactors, we must use advanced reactors to make uh, the a large amount of uranium-238 available for production of uh, nuclear energy. The enriching process is uh, uh, done by the uh, center fusion units as the one you can see in the figure. So, in nuclear reactors, we can maintain the chain reaction by thermal, rea by thermal neutrons. However, thermal neutrons must be moderated, which means that the neutron's energy must be decreased. When we decrease the energy of uh, slow neutrons, we uh, can't fission other, other atoms than uranium-235. But we can, low, we can use low enrichment of uranium-235. To obtain a high spectrum, our fastest spectrum neutron reactor, we must use a higher enrichment fuel. We must enrich the fuel with uranium 235 to a percentage of 20% or plutonium 15%. Uh, why we cost the, uh, the, take the cost of the enrichment uranium 235 to a higher percentage and obtain a high spectrum reactor because in in certain thermal reactors, the number of neutrons available is very low compared to uh, the number of neutrons produced in fast neutron reactors. We need this more neutrons produced as shown in the figure as the energy of neutrons increase, the number of uh, neutrons produced the bare fission increase. This number of increased neutrons can transform the uranium 238, which is, is not fissionable, to a, a fissionable uh, plutonium 239. So thermal reactors will enable us to use the uranium 238. We already have millions of tons of uranium 238. We see in this figure by breeding, producing, or generating plutonium 239, we will minimize our uh, cumulative natural uranium usage of natural uranium. If we depend only on light water once through cycle, which can uh, fission uranium 238, we will uh, use all our resources of natural uranium. However, by deploying fast reactors, we can decrease this uh, amount of uh, uh, natural resources and reduce the same amount of energy needed. <coughs> the second advantage of using fast neutron reactors, which, which are called uh, reactors of the future, is that the fast neutrons can uh, 
uh, destroy and burn long-lived minor actinides, which will achieve the, uh, uh, the goal of destroying, uh, getting rid of our waste of nuclear, uh, nuclear waste. As you can see in the figure, worldwide spent fuel using only light water reactors or thermal reactors, the accumulation of spent fuel will continue and we have, we'll have a, a very large amount of spent fuel. But using fast reactors, we can destroy this waste and reduce its radiotoxicity and significantly reduce waste storage time by approximately 300 years. For these reasons, in 2001, a group of countries, 10 countries exactly, initiated an initiative for developing uh, the future reactors or what called the fourth generation reactors. We currently are in the third react uh, generation reactors. The reactors that are being constructed today is third generation reactors. Reactors of the fourth generation are called reactors of the future. Three of these chosen reactors for the generation four are fast reactors. They are the gas-cooled fast reactor, sodium-cooled fast reactor, lead-cooled fast reactors. Present work. Aim of the work, design of a full core model for a large-scale gas-cooled fast reactor using a, a computational code called MCNBX in order to study and analyze the neutronic characteristics of the gas-cooled fast reactor related to the design and the operation of the reactor. Using this model and the simulation, we will investigate its ability to achieve fuel sustainability, which means reduce, is it produce enough fuel to refuel the, the next cycle, and investigate its ability to burn long-lived minor actinides waste. The figure shows the uh, layout of the gas-cooled fast reactor. This is the core of the reactor, which, we ha which I have modeled. And this is the uh, uh, cooling unit. Monte Carlo n particle code is a code used for, based on Monte Carlo method. It simulates the events Inventors including absorption, fission, elastic scattering that occur during each particle life. And in, as more and more such histories are followed, the nutrient distribution becomes better known and the behavior becomes clear. This figure shows the uh, designed models. The first design is the full core consisting of two fuel zones, the blue, blue region and the red region. Around it is the reflector region. This is a close-up uh, uh, figure of the fuel assembly, and this is a fuel bin. This shows the arrangement of fuel bins in the assembly and the, the, the structure of the fuel bin. Results and the conclusion. First, we have validated another study that uh, modeled the reactor with another code and the, our uh, design model is comparable results to the uh, previous study. The neutron uh, flux, which is responsible for the fission, is comparable in our study with the another study, as can seen in the figure. In this figure, we show that the total fissile materials, the plutonium that we began with, is already constant during the entire burn-up period, which means that the reactor managed to produce uh, the, the required plutonium from uranium-238. In this figure, we show that the plutonium-239 even increased its mass by 2.2 percentage. We gained a, a amount of 300 kilogram at the end of burn-up. This figure shows that the accumulation of minor actinides is very low compared to other uh, thermal reactors. In the conclusion, we concluded that fast reactors like GFR 
gas pool fast reactor can achieve sustainability where the conversion of uranium 238 onto plutonium 239 during build up enhances the concentration of the fissile nucleus. MCNB export results indicates that the four can achieve a 98 percentage breeding ratio at the end of the fuel cycle, remain 98 of the beginning, the fuel that we begin with. And the long lived minor actinides and lithium, neptonium, and ferrum can be burned in gas cooled fast reactors as there is an increased delta M of only 182 kilograms in minor actinide contents during the entire burn up duration. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Amr, for your valuable piece of work. Uh, before we move to the third research paper in our row for this session, maybe we need to call for the pending papers for the pending researchers. Let me try again. Professor uh, Gaiba, Professor John Gaiba, are you online? Right. Professor Gabafa, Gabafa, Professor Gabafa, Professor Tichsua, Professor Michael Tichsua. Okay, so maybe the third uh, research paper, we're going to pick the presentation uh, that uh, runs in the other, uh, the one that follows the session that follows our session then we uh, can um, hand on the floor to Professor uh, Mohammed Mahmoud. Are you with us? Professor Mohammed Mahmoud, are you with us? Mohammed. Professor Mohammed Mahmoud, are you with us? Hello. Professor Mohammed Mahmoud, are you with us? Hello. Mahmoud Atiyan. Yes, yes, yes. He's there. Yes. He's there. He's there. No, uh, Professor. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Okay, Professor uh, Muhammad Mahmoud Atiyah uh, will be uh, handed the, the floor for the coming 10 minutes uh, to present uh, the effects of cohesive soil depth on consolidation coefficients and compression index. Uh, okay. Please yes. uh, okay. for the coming 10 minutes. Thank you. Hello, everyone. This picture, uh, this paper for the effect of cohesive soil depths on consolidation coefficient and compression index. We uh, talk about introduction and experiment work and result and analysis and the conclusion for this paper. We say uh, we talk about soil consolidation is a compressibility with water escape from the point. Uh, of the soil uh, when the loads such as the foundation loads and underground structure are effect. This uh, uh, figures show the sediment and the friction sediment for structures, such as the building in Alexandria, Egypt. The aim of the study, uh, we uh, study the uh, changing for uh, co uh, for consolidation parameters due to the uh, depths uh, for cohesive soil layers. We study four sites in Calabria, government Egypt, uh, and for each site we we, we took three. Uh, sample from uh, the, under, the underground, uh, such as site one, we took uh, for uh, four and seven and ten meters from the A ground. This map shows the sites from uh, Calabria government in Egypt, site one, site two, site three, site four. This figure shows the main bore hole or site and shows the sample we are took from the site such as uh, site one uh, dips four dips seven dips uh, a ten. This table 
to the physical properties test that do in a soil sample that we are taking, such as the natural density and the natural content, liquid limit, plastic limit, and we uh, do soil classification for this cohesive soil. This table for site two and site three and site four, and this figure to the classification for of studied soil sample using plastic chart. This is, is the soil sample we are doing uh, to, uh, to uh, for odometer test for consolidation test, such as the drainage for uh, water that's escaped from up to down the water from the soil samples. Uh, this figure show odometer test that we are do uh, loading for the sample test that we are doing. And these figures show the loading and pressuring uh, to uh, the soil sample uh, and doing the consolidation test and, uh, and results. This is sample after pressuring. We can have an, a relation for uh, coefficient of consolidation CV and uh, the stresses that are we pressuring that are uh, when we load it, uh, more loaded, they are the coefficient of uh, consolidation uh, uh, Least with the value of uh, coefficient of consolidation is the least with uh, under pressure. These are uh, relations for four sites that we are doing. We can make um, relation for uh, DIPS 3 uh, with DIPS 1 and DIPS 2 and uh, to get uh, the relation for it. This is a relation that uh, between uh, coefficient of consolidation and the dips that we are do in cohesive a uh, soil. And this comparison between compression index and the swelling index for soil with the variant dips uh, in cohesive soil layers, such as site one, there are, we got, uh, got CC for, uh, for loading the uh, to the sample and we are uploading to the sample to get the swe swelling index uh, that go in uh, soil sample and they uh, to add uh, site one and site two and site three and site four this table that uh, the relation for deeps three with deeps one and deeps two uh, that's changing to due to the dips of soil. And this bar, uh, table uh, uh, shows the compression swelling index with uh, dips 3 to dips 1 and dips 2. That's a variation and the relation for compression index and the swelling index with dips of soil layer, uh, uh, cohesive soil layer. We have a, uh, finally uh, two formula show the uh, compression index with the dips uh, in cohesive soil layer. And this formula shows the swelling index with dips that uh, have been due in uh, cohesive soil layer. Recommendation studying the effect of consolidation during the type of soil such as uh, borsaid, such as swag, studying uh, and uh, studying the parameters through the method and the varying size of the uh, tested soil sample. And we can use the uh, finite, finite element in, uh, in, uh, analysis for uh, studying the consolidation reference for this paper. And thank you.
Thank you, Professor uh, Mahmoud, uh, for your uh, for your presentation, and thank you for respecting the time span. Uh, now we can, now we can move to the uh, fourth uh, research paper in, in the row. Uh, if we may call Professor uh, Johnson, Professor Nandwiki Johnson, are you online with us, Professor? Nandwiki Nan, Nan, Johnson, are you online with us? Uh, Professor Heba, with your permission, I think he's not around. I just search him. Uh, I think we have now with us uh, uh, Professor, Professor Gabafa. Gabafa, yes, please. You can yes, yes. Yeah. yes, so uh, now we're going to. Um, have uh, Professor uh, Gabafa, who's going to uh, present uh, a paper discussing the dynamics of uh, spatial uh, spread and rainwater management in the city of Lome, Togo. Professor Gabafa, are you with us? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, please accept thank the floor for the coming 10 minutes. Thank you. Uh, My work uh, is titled Dynamic of Spatial Spread and Rainwater Management in the City of Lomé. It will go through uh, the following planning. After the introduction, we, we get methods. And results. So uh, it should be the discussion. Urban water management is central to our societal concern. But urbanization has a significant impact on storm water management in the city of Lilume and improving surfaces in rural or urban area increases the velocity and runoff water, leading to increased flooding and erosion. Several solutions are possible to mitigate the consequence of urbanization that affects the drainage network and environment. In Lome, there is a dysfunction of the existing sanitation network and the agglomeration of Lome is different, developing behind the perimeter of uh, the municipality of Lome. We get also the population increase in the uh, town of Lomé. This paper aims to, to study the dynamic and land use for integrated management of storm water in the city of Lomé in order to reduce uh, flood risk and related diseases. The study area is the town of Lomé, but is planned as uh, three different zones. In Beach, uh, excuse me, Professor Gabafa, the, can you raise your voice? Professor Gabafa, uh, can you please raise your voice? Sorry. Can you please raise your voice? Thank you, thank you. This area, seaside in Magenta, we get the beach rain. And after the beach rate, you get in yellow the area as the lagoon, lagoon zone. And the third area is a uh, green area, is the plateau zone. For our study, the data collection consists on 
documentary analyst, which uh, give us the plot plan of the Lomé by the Ministry of Town Mal Planning and Housing and the head state of uh, hydraulic and energy in Togo. Flood vulnerability plans were uh, found at the Ministry of Environmental and uh, Forest uh, Management. The integrated disasters and land management project of the Ministry of Infrastructure and Transport give us the environmental resources and uh, vulnerability plan in the town. To update the plot plan, we use those plan existing and we computed them in a G system and AutoCAD. But the hydraulic parameters are also updated for the contrasting time. We use a Kipish formula for the uh, surfaces of uh, our catchment. We get them directly from the G system. So we compute also, we calculate also the slope of the catchment using the, uh, the grid lines. In this graphic, we saw the, for since to 1920, the uh, surfaces of the town of Lome. This uh, increasing up to the independent date in 1960, change its uh, uh, increasing uh, ratio. So we can get two types of uh, uh, increasing of the land use in Lomé. The first part from 1920 to 1980 is growth to an exponential equation shown here. But the land use, the, the land float also were here from uh, uh, Gino, Gionu 1999 study. The second part from 1990 to 2020 is a linear uh, range shown by the third equation here. And in this side, you show the occupation or the plot plan of the uh, Lome city who grow to north part and east part here. For the hydraulic parameters, we identify nine new catchments in the town. And each catchment are uh, surface from uh, 4.7 hectare to 44 hectares. The average slope is from 1.5% to 1.9%. The fragmentation considerably modify the adori parameter in the basin concerned and of its anterior net worth. This situation requires a good resolution this situation requires a global resolution of the flooding problem unlike one of intervention with which only shoot the problem specially. 
it's possible to update the plot plan of the city of Lome and to identify the major areas of extension of the city of Lome. It appears that the former rural areas to the northeast and north of the city have gradually abandoned their status of rural area in favor of urbanized areas. This situation is explained by the existence of pockets of villages in the town of Lomi. The later built residence or dwelling and come to stay in the absence of any prior development by the administration. Slum have also developed around the port area, the eastern extension of the city of Lome because of the precarious situation of the, of the unskilled labors used by companies and are generally located in free zone. This cohabitation between native and rural area with city dwells who have come from the city to settle complicated development effort. This situation was reported in 24. The plan indicates that the rural space of the municipality of Lome is now almost completed saturated, only 4% of undeveloped lots. The agglomeration of Lome is developing beyond, beyond the perimeter of the municipality of Lome onto territory of the prefecture of Gulf and Zio, especially toward the north along the national road number one, uh, Aguani Bay sector and the northwest along the road of Palini. Between 1970 and 1981, uh, the urban area of Lome increased from 1,900 hectares to 16,100 hectares. A near systematic urbanization occurred out in many depressions of the Toquen Plateau in the northwest and northwest district of the city. This naturally flooded depression through turned into a many section posing very serious and recurring flooding problem when they are urbanized. Another difficulty lays in the perception of the public that does not always easily accept to see the water come back to the surfaces. A fear often expressed is, for example, that of the risk of drawing in retention basins, whether they are dry or contained. <laughs> Thanks. The continuing expansion of the city of Lome therefore requires on the one hand the implementation of a new storm water treatment plan which will consider the hydraulic parameters of the updated watersheds and the update float plan of the city of Lome. The city of Lome is in full spatial spatial expansion. This ratios on the periphery accentuated the anarchic occupation of administrative reserve and flood from areas. The city of Lome experiences a first exponential horizontal spray gradient from 1914 to 1980 flowed by a linear gradient until 2020. Anticipation of housing and development policy could considerably mitigate the risk of flooding and promote 
integrated management of water resource in a city which in 2040 will spread over an area of 400 of thousand hectares. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Gabava, for your presentation about uh, the city of Lome, Togo. Uh, still uh, running the sessions uh, two and three simultaneously. Um, I Please allow me to call again for the missing papers or for the pending papers. Um, um, let's get back to Professor and so guide by John. Professor John, are you with us? Professor John, are you with us? Okay, uh, Professor uh, Michel Tuchsua, are you with us online? Professor Tuchsua, are you with us? Okay. Moving to section urban uh, three, we have um, presentation for Professor Johnson, Nada Kiwi, Professor Johnson, are you with us? I just I just called Professor Johnson Nadikwe, and uh, he said he's having a challenge of connection, but he is going to connect it, so we can call uh, Doctor Professor Rasha. Okay, so the coming uh, paper in the row is going to be for Professor Rasha Stuhi. She's uh, going to present a case uh, study for a proposed smart archaeological tourism work, work plan, a case study on the Holy Family journey in Sharia governance. Professor Rasha, please take the floor for the coming 10 minutes. I will start my session with Quran Karim first. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Khuzi ilayki bi gizai nakhla. Tasaqata alayki rutuban gamiya. Fakuli wa shrabi wa qarri aani. Our builder talks about a proposed smart archaeological tourism work plan. A case study on the Holy Family journey in Sharqiyya government. At our agenda, we will present the introduction, literature review, proposed model, testing and evaluation, and finally the conclusion and future work. <coughs> At our introduction, first, we focusing on the integrating advanced ICT technology with the tourism industry, which plays a key a vital role in enhancing tourism services and experience, particularly in the archaeological tourism context. This study suggests a smart work play that offers tourists to location destination and experience according to their preferences. In particular, tourists can express different preferences regarding the type of tourist site, the level of contention to apply private sites, the accessibility and convenience of different sections of a site and the distance and congestion of the train. First, and from this perspective, at our paper, tourist contention, convenience, and accessibility based smart tourism destination approach, we create uh, and suggest footstep approach to introduce to deliver visitors to the holy places at Delta Egypt using online services, believing they are always linked and don't have specialized IT skills. Uh, briefly uh, and quickly, I will uh, uh, talk about the Holy Family journey in Egypt, uh, starting uh, from Betlah to Gaza, and then to Zandrik. Uh, uh, and then they marched to El Arish and entered Egypt through the Sinai Desert from the northern side. They, uh, uh, they entered the city of Tel El Pasta uh, near the city of Zagazik in the Sharqaya Governorate, and about this about 100 kilometers from the city of Cairo in the northeast. The family left Tel El Pasta, heading south until it reached the town to uh, Mustorot. 
pass to the third, and from the third, they moving to north of Belpis. Uh, the holy uh, family remained at a tree known as the Virgin Mary tree. Uh, from Belpis, the family traveled to north to west to the town of Samanut. The holy family traveled north to west to the Rolos, and then they arrived in Kafri shared government. Okay, what's our contribution? The most notable contribution made at our paper uh, can be summarized at the uh, architecture of the CU control unit cloud centric IoT based architecture. This architecture assumes that the existence is the, we assume that there is existence of sensors in sections of tourist sites and road segments, silica, cellular and uh, connected to cellular or Wi-Fi uh, network. Uh, and the visitors had their small uh, smartphone or any other handheld uh, device available. Um, this control unit, the CU, exists on the cloud. There receives its main functionality, it receives, analyze, and generate required information for others. Uh, the analytical description of this model uh, differentiate from other which compare between various tourism sites and passes that leads to these sites. The accessibility and convenience and contention of tourist sites sections in addition, in addition to uh, road passes, congestion and distance have been combined and used for the first time. And thus we use uh, again in our evaluation. Uh, the proposed uh, photostop model uh, main components consists of the message preference uh, sent to the control unit, the CU, uh, from the user's smartphone, uh, which contain of the time, location, destination, okay, uh, and uh, connected to simulating database regional maps, database network coverage, and database tourism leverage. Uh, here, or you can uh, illustrate uh, the main components of the CU unit. Uh, first, the reception. Uh, this means you receive notification of user preference and inspect the field, therefore. The analysis, with you, this means you analyze the information gained by the message requests and um, found in the tourist location. The analytical module selected the best responsible of uh, selecting the best one after consulting the network coverage database and corresponding to the quality available over different buses. Uh, the generation of routes, this module produce the best route based on information analyzed. We use the algorithm of Google Maps, very famous algorithm, A-Star algorithm. And then the visualization of this route which send back the information to the user content. Next, next. Okay, about uh, for the step phases and analytical description, uh, as a suggested protocol consists of three phases, uh, as we uh, declared a transformation of message preference analysis of user preference and selection of geographical paths uh, according to these two equations. Uh, alpha is at uh, the first equation. Alpha represents a weight factor which could be used to give more importance to a certain term in equation. Uh, we give the weight of 0.7 so that the contention level of this side participate more. Um, at the second equation, we use the values of 0 0.2, 0 0.4, and 0 0.4 uh, to perform the, our experiments as uh, proposed uh, weight factors. Um, then uh, we put these factors toward the suggested sites uh, for less uh, congested uh, first, and then better coverage uh, by wireless network connection second and um, the, the accessibility uh, and the, the load of uh, the road uh, by any tree. <coughs> uh, 
uh, in the third uh, phase, the root generation module in the CU uh, used the analytical module information, uh, each section of the root and its corresponding width to measure and select the best geographical route uh, to the system. Uh, this sent back to the root visualization model uh, to be viewed in the uh, mobile user uh, smartphone. Of course, to validate our uh, work, we use simulator in an Android program. Uh, we adapt it through these uh, declared three phases for this purpose. And this is our uh, screenshots for our model. Uh, and the result in this section, we present the result of evaluating the footstep approach through a set of experiments. Uh, first, we, um, uh, we travel between six different locations in the next four figures, in the previous uh, figures, and in an order that starts with the first and finish with six among Sharpeya journey stations. We start with the Kazik, going to Tel El Basta, and marching from Tel El Basta to Bilbis, then go ahead from Tel El Basta to Samanud. We and we measure from Tel El Basta to Muskorot and Bilbis to Muskorot. It's our six locations. Put a step and then our conclusion, put a step has been found to recommend the more suitable sites in terms of a lower level of inner uh, site contention and inner site track congestion. Uh, also, it may be more distant than others because the passes to those sites are protected by reliable uh, wireless network connection. However, since start select a site of less crowded, more con uh, convenient and open section within each uh, uh, venue, it enables a tourist to have a much quicker tour with a lot of leisure uh, by calculating weight with different uh, routes. We footstep find that the best route will be uh, starting from Zagazib to Tel El Basta, Belbis, and Hostel. Thank you for your Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rasha, for your valuable piece of presentation. You've always have been uh, great input for our conferences. Uh, moving to research paper uh, number uh, six, uh, we have Professor Johnson, Nadi Kiwi. He's, he's around, he's online. Professor Johnson, do you hear us? Are you with us? Professor Johnson, are you with us? Yes, Professor Johnson. Uh, Johnson Duque is around. Yes, I'm around. Hello. Yes, well, well, welcome, Professor Johnson. Welcome on board. Uh, Professor Johnson is uh, going uh, to uh, present an investigation into the and fasting and All right. Can all participants? I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me? Introduction, yes. The ability of the pipeline and oil. Can you hear me? Okay. My, are you with us? Yes, yes, I'm with you. My name is Engineer Dr. Johnson Nunadipo. Your introduction of the background of study, the ability of the pipeline and oil tubular goods to properly depend on the physical integrity of pipe body and its connection. There are many threat concerns. He's muted. Doctor, we can't hear you. Hello? Yes, you are back. OK, I'm back, I'm back, I'm back, I'm back, I'm back. Yes, one of the major, uh, one of the major reasons why I decided to embark on this research work is because I noticed that in the in our oil and gas industry, basically the exploration on 
I noticed that um, uh, there have been there have been a corrosion problem that is affecting our piping. So that is the reason why I decided to embark on this particular research area on inspection and monitoring as well. Now, introduction and background of study. The ability of the pipeline and the oil tubular goes to properly depend on the physical integrity of the pipe body and its connections. There are many thread configuration applied to the oil and gas and pipeline casing and tubing. The verification of this function is to perform by a laboratory prototype testing prior to a marketing of the connection. Oh. Doctor, you're breaking again. Doctor, you broke. You're out again. We can't hear you again. We can't hear you, Doctor. Professor, Professor Johnson, are you online with us? Professor Johnson? I think he lost the connection or something. He's reconnecting. Dr. Kerry, do you think you can get hold of him and advice? Because he may not get in completely. Yes, he is. He is a I'm, I'm, I'm calling him and uh, he's having the challenge of the network. And then we'll, we'll see how we can, we can connect with him. Just one second. Okay, Dr. Uh, Kerry, if he's not able. I think um, uh, we, we, we have hello, the... Hello. Yes, hello, Johnson. Yes, I'm having a very serious network issue because it's raining heavily in my side here. Yeah. Okay, it's raining. The network is wet, yeah, so the thing is cracking down seriously. It's raining heavily, heavily, heavily. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, so I'm having a serious... I'm trying okay. to connect. I've used all the necessary platforms. It's I've okay. I've used all the necessary software, but nothing. The it's okay, it's okay. Heavily. It's okay, it's okay. Sorry, it's sorry for that. Thank you. It's Hello? Yes. yes. Hello? Yes, Dr. Kerry. Yes, uh, he said it is raining very heavy in his place. and uh... We had the call. Okay, the thank call. you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you very much indeed. I think uh, Professor Heba, uh, yes. and, um, he kindly do the discussion for your session because uh, Professor Johnson would not be able to join us. <laughs> So, so we have uh, pending in uh, from uh, session uh, urban two. We have pending Professor John Gaiba John, and we have Professor Michel Kuchsua. I think um, yeah, we've called them several times, but I don't think they are around to do the, the presentations. So maybe maybe we uh, call for the discussion, or what do you think? Yes, please. We can go for discussion. Okay, so thank you very much to you participants for your presentations and your researches, which have been of distinguished, uh, have been distinguished with uh, privileges and level high level quality of work. And we will now open uh, the floor, the discussion for 20 minutes, and the floor is welcoming. Any questions? Please. I would like to thanks to Dr. Mohammed Badawi for his research and uh, ask him, uh, uh, can you uh, show us what about uh, the effect of uh, flange, uh, width of flange angle 
on the shear stress from uh, the flat slab. Uh, my question is for Dr. Mohammed Badawi, uh, research number 33. You have called, you have mentioned a proposed equation. What do you mean by proposed equation? The equation, any mathematical equation, either it is an empirical one coming from experience and results, or mathematical equation which can be derived from the first principles. What, it, what do you mean by proposed equation? This is. Uh, Professor Heba, I can see Dr. Kiari is raising his hand. Yes, thank you, boss. I can take my question. Professor uh, Kiari, accept the floor for your question. Okay, thank you very much. My question goes to the guy in the, the nuclear nuclear waste minimization. Uh, actually, he made presentations of two, two reactors. And uh, what I want to say, indeed the first reactor reduces the waste minimizations. What about the radioactivity of the waste? He's talking about the waste as a core spent fuel of the reactor, of the reactor core. And then, is it the quantity of that one that has been reduced or the efficacy of the radiation of the, the radiation of the waste? We do know the plutonium, uh, the uranium 238, which is the ground stage, and the uranium 235 is the enriched enrich one. And uh, at the reactor core, at the lifespan, when the lifespan of the uh, when the lifespan of the core energy is spent, is it the quantity in terms of the size or in terms of the radiation efficacy that is reduced? Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Professor uh, Mohammed Badawi will uh, get to answer the first question, please. For uh, the first question, uh, in which ask about uh, the flanges effect in punching shear resistance. The flanges, uh, especially compression flanges, enhance the shear strength of flat slab, in which flanges has a dual action in flexural and shear resistant. So when we measure with contribution in shear resistance, we doesn't find uh, uh, the difference, uh, the completely difference. That is confirmed that the great effect of compression flanges and bunching shear resistance. So that's okay. For the second equation, uh, for the proposed equation, the proposed equation get from uh, experimental uh, and heavy numerical analysis results. Then we can use regression analysis by using the Excel program and the MATLAB program. Uh, uh, all of this based on the crack pattern and the mode of failure that can get from uh, the experimental results. Uh, this crack pattern and the mode of failure get two parameters, parameters B node one and the parameters B node two. Parameters B node one uh, located at a distance equal E1 in the proposed equation. And parameters, a bigger parameter, uh, can get about distance equal e two. Uh, 
so there are two perimeters b node one and b node two b node one uh, because of uh, uh, because of uh, uh, nearest from the column weights uh, have a high stress. So in the proposed equation, we can get the proposed equation V capital equal 0.63 square root FCU. It's a high stress beside B node one, <coughs> low parameter. And the grip parameter uh, is, uh, is far away the end of shear head. Grip parameter B not two, but with a low strength because of uh, 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 because of uh, the, the far away from the, the column uh, the column face. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, I, I, I think, uh, yeah, empirical uh, formula for uh, critical bunching failure, uh, it is not uh, the, the optimum solution for this case. Uh, so, uh, uh, bunching failure is, uh, is, uh, is the most critical failure in flat slab system. So, uh, uh, we should do experimental uh, results, great experimental result, and the huge uh, numerical analysis to can predict exactly the bunching shear capacity of flat slabs with the effect of shear heads. You did the job of the experimental At the end, the experiments and distribution that analysis, all you put them in critical All, all codes, it doesn't advise for empirical uh, form, uh, but to, uh, to predict uh, the bunching capacity, uh, you can uh, uh, also, we can do experimental results and huge numerical analysis, so we can find the, the effect of uh, shear heads exactly. And uh, finally, uh, uh, the proposed equation, uh, 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 the proposed equation was conserved compared with experimental results in prediction. Uh, 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 yeah. So the, 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 the proposed equation have agreed influence in prediction of bunching shear of flat slabs uh, with shear heads. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you for your clarification, Professor Badawi. Uh, the next question was from Professor Kiari to uh, Professor Amr Ibrahim. Please be my guest. Which one was about the, uh, the mass or the radio toxicity? When we're dealing with the radioactive waste, we, uh, what is the importance the, uh, the time. If we uh, store the fission products for uh, its low half, half, half lifetime, in other side, long lived radioactive, which are called minor actinides and resin carrier neptunium, are, uh, we can destroy these elements, which have very, very long uh, lifetime and will cost us to store it for a, long, a, very, a very long time. Uh, we take to be non-radioactive. So is it not the mass that we uh, are interested in? We, we can't destroy the fission products. And it's half lifetime is small. What the problem was is with the long half lifetime elements, which can be destroyed in, in fast reactors. Is it clear? It's clear. Thank you, Professor Amr, for clarification. Uh, the floor is still open for discussion. Uh, 
please, please. Professor Abdullah Dehshan would love to, uh, he's raising his hand, he wants to ask a question. Yeah. Uh, nowadays, they talk about uh, black sand, which has been discovered in Egypt. There are millions of tons of black sands in this, on the seashore for a distance almost 50 kilometers, starting from the from Bursaid till somewhere on the seashore. This black sands consists of some, some rare uh, metals, almost 18 kind of rare metals. Among it is platinum and titanium, which can be used in uh, manufacturing rockets, aircrafts, uh, reaction activities, atomic reaction activities, and so on. I asked, I wanted to ask Mr. Amr Ibrahim, have you got an idea about this effect, effectiveness of sea land? on atomic reactions or atomic activities, if you, if you have some idea of it. The material, you, you have the, uh, you have a request for the same presenter or another presenter, sir? Professor Ratemo. Oh, the last present on the holy footsteps. Okay, I'll, I will, we will come back to this. I wait. Sorry, okay, Professor. Wait. Sorry, wait. Professor, to interrupt your uh, answering. Thank you. Uh, in answering the question, all elements are can be used in manufacturing the elements of the reactor in its uh, aerial stage, and can we can use these elements to uh, manufacture uh, a, a better uh, cladding material for the reactor or structure material. So it can be used in thermal reactor and fast reactors. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Amr, for your clarification. The next question comes from uh, Professor uh, Rama Ratimo to uh, Professor uh, Rasha Stuhi concerning her paper. I assume it was, uh, it's about the case study on the Holy Family journey in Sharia governance. Yes, yes, Madam Chair. Thank you very much for sharing this very ably. I would like just to very interesting paper by Russia. Could she tell yes. us how she will conserve these footsteps for the generations to come in the future? And the which way is she tracking them? North, south, west, or east? Thank you. Professor uh, Russia, you are muted, please. Yeah, she's muted. You are muted. Uh, please unmute. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, uh, I think you uh, ask about uh, a holy uh, family journey stops at their journey. That's right or not? No, this, this was a demo. This was Ratemo asking how you will preserve, once you get those footsteps right, how will you preserve them? And were you going north, south, west, or east? Let's publish um, everywhere at uh, our uh, civilization organizations and uh, uh, our uh, tourism agency and uh, published uh, from uh, um, worldwide documents, publications about tourism in Egypt. So uh, the map of uh, the Holy uh, uh, Family Journey uh, published anyway uh, with its stops and the number uh, uh, from uh, the east at Sinai and um, do Delta uh, area and uh, then south to 
the South Valley um, till uh, Asyut, oh. uh, Darnaka, Darnaka Mountain. This is uh, yeah. This is declared where uh, at uh, the map of uh, the Holy Family journey uh, with numbered stones. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so welcome. Thank, thank you, Professor Rasha, for your clarification. The floor is still open for discussion. Any further questions? No further questions. Okay, so uh, ladies and gentlemen and dear participants, thank you indeed for your valuable contribution in our conference, the first asterisk, uh, first asterisk uh, conference on engineering and informatics for Africa's urbanization. With uh, full uh, respect, we reach the end of our session, uh, session Urban 2 and Urban uh, 3. And uh, now I leave the floor to Professor uh, Chiari, who will be uh, handling the closing session. Professor Chiari, please accept the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Hiba, for well-moderated sessions she sessions both of the she moderated both of the sessions and uh, some of the participants some of the presenters were not there and uh, thank you for bringing us to the end of the session it is indeed said that for everything it has an end anything that has beginning has an end and we have come to the end of the program when it is exciting scintillating and encouraging uh, without wasting much time i will call upon my executive director and the person of Dr. Engineer Ahmed Hamdi. He is the executive director of the African Union Scientific Technical Research Commission and also the executive director of the African Scientific Research and Innovation Council to give a closing remark for the participants. Dr. Uh, Hamdi. Thank, thank you much indeed, Dr. Kerry. I would like really starting uh, these remarks by just appreciate and show the gratitude to our colleagues in the Olabur Institute, especially to the president of the conference, uh, Professor Dr. Abdullah Dashan. Also, I would like to recognize the efforts made by the colleagues uh, in the Obur Institute, namely Professor Midhat Mukhtar, Professor Khalid Bahnasi, Professor Magdi Hosni, and Professor Kamal Shebra, and indeed, uh, my co-host, uh, engineer, Dr. Walid Dashan. In the level of the, my commission or in the level of our commission, the African Union Scientific and Technical Research Commission, and ASRIC, I appreciate the role played by the chair of the Bureau of ASRIC, Dr. Professor uh, Ratemo Michiaka, and the, all the members of the Bureau, especially uh, Professor uh, Sami Chumbu, uh, who will be missed today, but he's very active, a very participant, participatory action and activities in during our all meetings. Also, Dr. Kerry, I appreciate your work, Mary Johnson, Gilbert, Nali, and uh, Adizi, among others. Uh, before handing over to you, Dr. Kerry, I would like to say tomorrow is 9 of September. So let's have a quiz. What is this 9 of September for all of us? What that means, 9 of September for all of us? So I will give 30 seconds to think, raise your hands if you are aware, and let me pick one or two to tell us what is the 9th of September, which is tomorrow for us. And it's a very important day for all of us. That is good. Unfortunately, I, I can't see any of the uh, colleagues, uh, Marie, Ah, including that we. No, 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 I don't need you. I don't you. I don't need yes. you to 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 take the floor, Doctor Kerry, yes, to I answer. Know you need us. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I mean, I need all the colleagues around to understand. Tomorrow is the 9th of September, and it is the African Union Day. So mm -hmm. a meeting participated by about 70 or 80 African prestigious scientists. We are mm -hmm. not fully aware what is uh, this day is. And the 9th of September is a very important day in the history of Africa. And I'm going just to brief you a little bit about this, because if we don't know the history and 
how our people, founding fathers, suffer to make us where we are today. And we will not be able to succeed without their support and their uh, advancement for this continent and help and support. I will not take much from your time because I know many people don't like history, but if we don't know our history, we will not know our future. The Organization of African Unity was established in May, 14th of May, 1963. And it has the mandate to liberate our continent and to support diplomatic channels and financial and military and logistics aid to liberate the continent. And this is was the milestone for the liberation of all of our member states. And this is was championed by Julius Nerere, Gamal Abdel Nasser, and Kwan Ankuromi, and finally the, 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 the Madiba, Nelson Mandela of South Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, in 2002, the African head of states and government launched the African Union as the new phase of the organization of African unity. Unlike the African unity organization, we are not anymore looking for liberation or political liberation or taking armies out of our uh, homelands. Rather, this is called the African Union in its new mandate is calling for economic liberation. We need to liberate our economy. We need to liberate our mineral resources. We need to have an Africa that new integrated, Africa that is developed by its own people, Africa that able to harvest the minerals and resources and protect the environment for the benefit of this generation and others to come. And this is where we are going to celebrate tomorrow in the level of the African Union. It's the African Union Day, the new born for Africa that focusing on development and improving the lifestyle of its people. So please, professors, doctors, engineers, all participants in this meeting, commemorate tomorrow at the African Union Day because we are all need to participate act, act, actively to achieve the aspiration of the African Union Agenda 2063. I'm going to stop myself here. And before handing the floor to Dr. Kiari back, I reiterate my gratitude to all participants who participated in this meeting, all participants who present for us, all participants are able to join, intervene, interact in this new era of uh, communication, a new era of conferencing. We call it the new norm. Hopefully next year when we have the second conference, we are going to be physically together shaking hands, hugging each other, talking around coffee breaks, and among others. Ladies and gentlemen, I was so happy to be a member of the organizing committee, and I really uh, appreciate all the efforts everybody contributed to this conference to make it successful. Wish you all the best, and thank you very much indeed. Over to you, Dr. Chiari. Long life, Africa. Long life, African scientists. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Hamdi, for the reminder about the Africa Day. And uh, for us at the African Union, it is a public holiday also tomorrow, which is also we can celebrate it. Uh, next on the line, there is no any other person in the person of Professor Retimo Micheka. Professor Retimo Micheka is the past and the pioneer chair, chair of the African Scientific Research and Innovation Council. He has been with us since the launching and inauguration about three years. In these three years, he has achieved a lot of achievement. Under his leadership, we have what we have, what you have had under the ASRIC movement presented by Dr. Hamdi is all under his chairship were achieved. Professor Ratemo Mechenka, you can take over for your closing remarks. Gary, Gary, thank you very much for those very kind words. Thank you so much. And really, my pleasure to be with you. This being part of the last activities we do, because at the end of this year, we shall actually give up. I just go through very short statements that I got down, jotted, and said, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, 
African scientists, engineers, partners, and stakeholders who are seated here today, you are about 30, 33 right now. It's a great pleasure to really see this fulfillment of the maiden first conference of ASRIC on engineering science. And I must say this, that is a milestone achievement for the continent and they did for ASRIC. Realizing the importance of this conference and we really need to sustain the growth. This growth relies on the implementation of the strategies and the policies that we must ensure resilience in the face of industrialization, putting to cognizance the importance of African urbanization, and being the first conference on engineering, it is timely, and that as we celebrate tomorrow, we better go back and check maybe one or two issues, two papers that we probably listen to very carefully, particularly on the mega cities and the cities growing with a lot of speed. Everybody we hear by the year, so many years, 20, 30, 20, 40, most of the continents, people will be actually residing in the cities. I would like to say this, that as ASHRIC, we commit and ensure that what we do is felt outside and it is going to be a milestone in the future. I therefore call scientists, researchers and engineers to run with vision, achieving really what glorious gains we have gotten today and being consistent with what we have learned here this afternoon. The conference has spoken a lot, portable water, good roads, networking, information, smart cities, and the continuous discussions, although we have actually been doing this virtually. The future of our continent lies on the passion of us, you and me, good scientists, excellent people who have actually attended this meeting throughout. Let me say this, that at the end of this year, exactly on the 22nd, 25th of November, we shall be having our final meeting for the present sitting bureau. The Congress will meet in Abuja and all of you are welcome and it will be a fiscal meeting in the beautiful city of Abuja in Nigeria. Let me applaud and thank every one of you, your commitment, the secretariat, I think my excellent CEO Hamdi Engineer has thanked you all, starting from Kiarie, Morie, Ade, Abe, everybody that has really been putting in time on this particular conference and the organization. Let me not forget the two organizations, the UNESCO, several organizations, UNESCO, World Federation of Engineers, Federation of African Engineering Organization, Obo Institute for hosting this meeting, UNESCO and the UN Habitat. Ladies and gentlemen, really, it is really a conference of the beginning, a landmark, a conference I would call our legacy as the four, five colleagues on the Bureau for accepting to be with us, Mosto, Sami, Breeze, and the my friend Ferry James from Zambia, who would not make it, but most of the time they, they just sent apologies and have been following their discussions. Let me conclude by saying this, let us build this continent. It is left to us, issues are our issues. You engineers, I'm part, I'm in the environment and weed research, weeds, chemicals, and all these where glyphosate falls in that category. Let us all really build, love the continent. And I like the way Engineer Hamdi says, long live, long live, and let us not give up at any one given point. The change you make, no matter how small, has got impact on the future generations. So I conclude wishing you well. Let me say this in Kiswahili, you say thank you, Asante Sana. Asante Kila Moja, we thank you very much for every one of you. Masipoku, next door, up north, north central. Obrigado, and then Shukran every one of you as you take off and whenever you travel out 
travel safely. I'm really thanking again my colleagues. I see them in the podium. Obua stage in Cairo, those who made it. Thank you so, so, so much for being with us throughout. Attendance has been great, and I can talk for hours. Other than saying goodbye, shukran. We'll be seeing you again at some opportunity. Have a very nice travel, nice thoughts. Happy celebrations tomorrow. Hey, you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much, uh, Thank Professor Thank you very Rachel. much. And I apologize for, I apologize for the new story. Uh, Sorry. This has brought us to the end of our program, but this is a reminder. Please, those presenters, the authors, Dr. Kiari, send us Dr. Kiari, your... Dr. Kiari, Dr. Kiari, I yes. think there is a speech for uh, the president of the conference, Professor Abdullah Dashan. I think so. Sorry, yes, yes there is, there is. Sorry, it's an oversight. So you are the master of ceremony, sir. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, without wasting much time, I will call our very strong, able partners in the, in the person of Professor Abdullah Deshan of the Obur Institute. Obur Institute, I had it for the first time when we are about to do this conference. And I quickly went to their website to see what they have been doing. In terms of the engineering information and the informatics and others, it is magnificent remarkable and it's a place that everyone will love to be there by god grace inshallah we will be there professor abdallah deshan you have the floor to give a closing remark thank you bismillah rahman rahim yarfa allah alladhina amanu minkum alladhina utu alilm darajat sadaq allah alazim assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah at the end of our conference, the first asterisk conference on engineering science, engineering and informatics for Africa organization, I would like to extend my sincere thanks and appreciation to His Excellency, Minister of High Education and Scientific Research of Egypt, Professor Khalid Abdel Wattar, for sponsoring and supporting this conference. All the gratitude to Her Excellency, Professor Sara Anayaj, Commissioner ESTI, for continuous support and encouragement. Also, heart thanks and gratitude to Professor Rafimo Meshika, Chair of ASTRIC, Engineer Carmen Bu Shadid, Federation of African Engineering Organization, Professor Dr. Engineer Kong Ki, President of WFEO, and last but not least, Professor Ahmed Hamdi, the director of ASPEC. The organization of this conference was planned, as you know, to be face to face, but due to uncontrolled circumstances, online was our solution to move on. Our conference included three themes urban and, uh, and mega cities, first one. Second one was big data. Third one was eco-engineering. This conference was distinguished by some privileges and the characteristics that occur for the first time. First, this is the first conference of our Astrid. Second, this conference is of a hybrid nature which is a combination of online and face-to-face. -face. Third, for the first time, graduates of Obur Institutes are given the opportunity to participate in research and gain self-confidence as a part of their qualification for scientific research. Fourth, distinguished researchers opened new doors, new media, and the horizon for future completeness studies, such as A, improving the dynamic properties of cement, concrete mixed by, by means of additives. This research needs more effort and more details for it. Second, or B, removing the plastic granules that pollute the water of seas and rivers by using what is called magnetic fluid. 
C. In education, in education aspect, we suggest that teaching methods and university book to be interactive electronic book, interactive ebook. However, extended study is required for this matter. Further study is needed for this because this is a very important point uh, to change the, the, the method of learning instead of being face to face or online only, either this or that, the book should be interactive e-learning. This is a new name for the uh, literature, literature and uh, students is in need of something to be in, in his hands. Further studies we ask participants to make on it. At the end, my recommendation could be summarized as follows. Constructive cooperation between Oberlin Institutes and the African Union to conduct joint research starting with the completeness or completion of the three dimensioned topics or, or researches. Number two, cooperation and participation between Oberlin Institutes and the African Union to establish a high specialized institute in Egypt. This we, we wouldn't forget it. That is similar to the five institutes established by the African Union in sister African countries. And finally, I would like to extend my gratitude and appreciation to the organization committee headed by Dr. Ahmed Hamdi, Dr. Mirhat Mohtar, and Dr. Kamar Shem. My sincere gratitude goes also to the deans and the vice deans of Obur Institutes, the institute staff members, administrators, everyone who contributed to the, to the success of our conference. Long live Egypt, long live African countries, long live African Union and the Google Institutes, and God bless you all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Abdullah Deshan, the Chancellor of the Obur Institute. Uh, for housekeeping for our presenters, please remember to send us the, your presentations, the PowerPoint. It is going to be on our website. All the papers for those who want to, it will be on the website of our institute and uh, that of the Obu. And uh, thank you, everyone. You can open your video as, so that we can just have a group photo for the ending of the, this thing. It will be very good to be part of our uh, report so that we can see the pictures. And that is the new norm for the, uh, for the pictures. We appreciate all of you. Everyone, thank you very much. And we wish you successful stay in your respective places and areas. And for anything you want regarding the conference, you can write to us anytime we can respond to you. There are a number of uh, events that are coming up from the ASRIC site. You will log on to our website. We had so many programs that are coming and every time, if you need invitation, you can contact us and we'll be. And remember also, when you register, you will be on our database. For all our events, you will be getting the required information. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. I see Secretariat. Thank you very much, Secretariat. You are now surfaced. Thank you. So Thank how you do we, much. who is taking the picture? Um, how many? I think yes. Dr. Kerry, he, he just. Yeah, I'm the one taking the picture. <laughs> but, Thank you. Uh, Tell us. The people are not opening their pictures. They are, this thing, please, you can open it. We want to take the pictures. Picture is very important. Picture is history. <laughs> yep. Control print screen. You tell us. Thank you. Uh, that's all, uh, that's all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Talk mm -hmm. again some other time. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful yeah. being with you people. Uh, thank you very much, dear colleagues. Thank you.
Thank you, Professor Atemo. Thank you, Professor Abdullah. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, all presenters, all participants. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you so much, Thank you. Thank you so much. And, uh, Thank you. Thank you, Adi, sir. And I see you really had a group. Thank you very Thank much. You. And thank the chair, the chairs, madam. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for all. And the whole. Thank you, the whole. The whole has been very, very majestically organized. Thank you. And how do I snap this guy's name?